hopefully folks registered to be here in person because we may have some uh, partners of ours joining us today. But I'd like to welcome you all and everybody that's watching online uh, to Palo OES. This is the first in what we hope will become a continuing series of uh, what I like to call conversations on key emergency management issues that we're uh, working through uh, here in California. My name is Eric Lamro. I am the uh, Acting Deputy Director for Response Operations here at Palo OES. And over the last couple years, had the opportunity to also serve as the Acting Deputy Director of Recovery Operations. Back in June, uh, Governor Newsom held the first ever Emergency Management Summit on, on, on here in California. It was a phenomenal opportunity to bring together emergency managers, fire and law enforcement professionals, and city and county uh, leadership, as well as uh, both elected and senior leadership to talk about those issues that we're challenged with here in California when it comes to emergency management. Obviously, over the last decade, what we deal with on a regular basis in California has become more and more complex. Uh, I can't help but uh, say, to bring a smile to Sherry McCracken's face, who's with us today, it's uh, by, by all means unprecedented uh, what we've been dealing with over the last several years. But it truly is, uh, with the impacts uh, climatologically of what we're dealing with, uh, with the population increases, uh, and with a number of other struggles that we've got, the ability to respond effectively and recover from both natural and human-caused disasters is uh, becoming more and more complex. And so the purpose of the conference in June and the purpose of today uh, is to continue that dialogue, to continue that conversation. Our hope at Cal OES and with the support of the Institute for Local Government, the California Association of Counties, and the League of California Cities, is to continue this dialogue on a regular basis, talking about key subjects that are important to all of us, or perhaps are the greatest challenges that you're dealing with at the city and county level. And so today, we're gonna start by talking about recovery. It was a component of our conference back in June. It was probably one of the most well-received seminars at that conference and it was obvious we need, needed to spend more time sort of digging into what does it mean when local governments proclaim emergencies what does it mean when you're asking for assistance from the state or federal government what do the programs mean what are the authorities that are exist what are the things we can and can't do and then so that's going to be the first half of today our chief counsel for cal OES, alex powell our Deputy Chief Counsel Jennifer Bollinger are going to be speaking with you today, and they are the ones behind the scenes that help to ensure that we're maximizing the assistance that we can secure for local governments uh, following a major disaster. They're working in close partnership with Ryan Buras, our Deputy Director of Recovery and his recovery team, to collectively work to ensure that we're maximizing the authorities that are out there and the programs that are available to support local governments. As I said over the last couple years, our experience in working to secure uh, both state and federal assistance uh, has grown exponentially. Uh, just over the last two years, we've had nine major disaster, presidential disaster declarations in California. And so with that, we have learned a lot about how to sort of work the machine with the federal government. Having Ryan join us as our deputy director of recovery, uh, given his long experience in FEMA, has been phenomenal to help us ensure that we're um, doing everything we can to support local governments. And so today's gonna be two parts. Alex and Jennifer are gonna start the day off with us uh, talking about the process. And then uh, I'm pleased to have with us today Sherry McCracken, the um, Chief Administrative Officer for Butte County, and Reva Feldman, the City Manager for the City of Malibu, who are both gonna provide a presentation on their experiences last year with both the Camp Fire and the Woolsey Fire, and what that meant to their community, what are the lessons that they're taking out of this, and where are they directing their communities moving forward to be ready for that next event. Ryan Pierce, our Deputy Director of Recovery, will also be joining us to talk about where our recovery operation is going. Obviously, we are evolving our recovery operations as we deal with these uh, ever more complex incidents the way we deal with housing of folks after the, a major disaster, the way we handle debris operations, the utilization of 
a multitude of other state and federal agencies through our long-term recovery framework to help cities and counties, again, maximize the programs and dollars that are out there. So Ryan's gonna talk a little bit about that, and Reva and Sherry uh, will speak, and then we'll end the day with a Q&A session with all three of them, where we can dig into those issues a little bit more. What I wanna make clear to everybody here in the room and online is that uh, I want this to be a dialogue. So during uh, Alex and Jennifer's presentation, please um, raise your hand, ask questions. If you've got ideas or things that you've utilized in your community that have been effective, and you think others should know about that, please feel free. I want this to be an active dialogue. Online, if you've got comments or questions, I would ask you to email Chris Berry to my staff at chris.berry at caloes.ca.gov and we'll ensure that your comments and questions get incorporated uh, into the session here today. So with that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Alex Powell and Jennifer Bollinger. I'm the Assistant Chief Counsel for Cal OES. I've been, been here about what, close to four years, four and a half years now. Um, I have a background of both public entity defense work, uh, litigation, and um, and work for a couple of state agencies as well. So, um, and this is Alex Powell. Do you want to? Sure. sure. Yeah, so, uh, Alex Powell, I'm the Chief Counsel here. Uh, I've been with Cal OES for a little over six years. Uh, was, came from the private practice in civil litigation. Uh, just a quick story about how I kind of got into emergency management. I'm originally from New Jersey, and back in 2012, I was uh, back home visiting family. Hurricane Sandy hit, and um, didn't expect it to be as bad as it was, of course. My family was lucky. A lot of friends and family were not, uh, and they had some, some significant damage. And I remember thinking, how do, how do communities rebound from that, right? I've never experienced that. What do you do? How do you pick up the pieces? How do you... Um, restore some sense of normalcy in your lives. And then a couple months later, there was an opening here, and I thought that was a perfect opportunity to jump in. I'm very passionate about this mission. I love the work that we do, and so um, it's my pleasure to, to be here to talk with you all. And to brag about Alex, he started as a uh, uh, staff counsel here and uh, got promoted and worked his way up and proved himself, and ultimately uh, got appointed both, both by Brown and Newsom um, to full position. So in any event, um, we're gonna talk about proclamations and disaster assistance. And where we're gonna head in this conversation, it, we're gonna briefly address the authorities that govern uh, the disasters and proclamation process. We'll talk about local proclamations, gubernatorial proclamations, um, what's, what we call CDAA, California Disaster Assistance Act. Um, debris missions when an event is so large that we have something called a PPDR program, Private Property Debris Removal Program, and then of course uh, the Stafford Act and Stafford Act declarations when the federal government steps in and becomes, it becomes a federal disaster and the president's issuing uh, emergency decks or major disaster declarations. So the authorities, the Emergency Services Act is what governs the state of California for disasters. It gives the governor broad powers to uh, issue orders, waive statutes, suspend regulations, um, and and um, that's where we derive the authority to issue uh, uh, pro disaster proclamations also. And then CDAA, California Disaster Assistance Act, it's the governing uh, statutory body that um, provides authority for the state to come in under certain circumstances and provide assist financial assistance to locals for uh, certain events. And then of course, the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Act. That is the federal statutory scheme that kicks in when uh, the state ends up uh, seeking assist financial assistance or direct federal assistance from the federal government and the event becomes so large that it's beyond 
the state's uh, capacity to handle on its own. So local emergency proclamations. Um, why does the local want to proclaim? Well, uh, with proclamations, it, it is indicating to the state that um, there's, uh, there's a situation where it's beyond the capability of the local. Um, it can activate um, pre-established emergency provisions. So if you have certain ordinances in place that are triggered by a local proclamation, you may want to do that. Um, and it provides immunity for certain actions and decision making when you're responding to uh, a disaster and then of course extraordinary police powers. And then there are four steps. Or so who can proclaim? It's a county, city and county, and city. And a proclamation demonstrates that it's beyond the local's capability. And there's four steps when you when you want to proclaim. You proclaim, you ratify, you continue, you terminate. Those are the things you want to think of. So here's the timeline summary of a local proclamation. So it can, a local proclamation can be issued by a governing body or an official identified by uh, ordinance within 10 days of an incident. So that's critical to keep that 10 day period in mind. Um, and then the uh, governing body would want to ratify the local proclamation if, an, if it was an official that issued uh, the proclamation. And you have to do that within seven days. And then there's a renewal for every 60 days. Sometimes if the uh, event is so catastrophic uh, the governor, and it ends up being um, a state declared emergency, the governor may uh, waive the uh, renewal of every 60 days. I think we saw that in Camp, yeah, camp. Um, and then we, uh, there's an asterisk here in January 1st, 2019. Um, the legislature increased the renewal to the, from 30 to 60 days. So, um, so what constitutes a local emergency? Uh, so up there, uh, there's a paragraph that is taken right out of the statute, but essentially it's a duly proclaimed existence of conditions of disaster or extreme peril to the safety of, person, uh, safety of persons and property within the limits of a county, city and county or county, caused by such conditions, and then it lists out um, uh, within the statute the types of things that you could proclaim for, but the key is here is which are or are likely to be beyond the capability or control uh, of a political subdivision. So that's, that's your, as a local jurisdiction, you're, this, this is how you would explain to us uh, or demonstrate that an event is beyond the capability of your jurisdiction. And I want to go back real quick to something Jennifer mentioned. Under the Emergency Services Act, only a city, a county, or in San Francisco's case, a city and county can proclaim a state of emergency. That's not to say special districts couldn't proclaim, school districts couldn't proclaim, um, but to be a valid proclamation under the Emergency Services Act, and then uh, there's a tie to CDAA, which we'll explain, it has to be one of those three. And then we'll explain in more detail about how the CDA process works and how you can come in uh, as a district underneath the county that you're, that you're resting. So as Jennifer mentioned, uh, a, the proclamation under the Emergency Services Act must be proclaimed only by the governing body of the jurisdiction uh, or by an official designated in an ordinance that was enacted by that uh, governing body. It must be ratified by the board within seven days. Uh, this again just increased from 30 days to 60 days, but the governing body must renew that proclamation uh, every 60 days, and then ultimately the governing body will terminate uh, the, the proclamation once conditions no longer warrant uh, there to be a local emergency proclamation. So this is what I was talking about, about the interplay between CDAA and the Emergency Services Act. So under CDAA, a local emergency is defined as a local emergency as proclaimed under Section 8630 of the Emergency Services Act, which is specific to a county, a city, or a city and a county. And you must have a local proclamation that's valid under the Emergency Services Act to trigger potential CDA eligibility. There's still a, a process that we'll undertake to review any request for CDA, but to even open the door, there must be a valid proclamation. So uh, once there's a valid proclamation, the local agency may qualify for CDAA uh, and um, Generally, it's a totality of the circumstances, so there are a lot of factors that, that we'll, we at CalVS will look at, um, and that, that ranges from the fiscal capability of the jurisdiction and the budget to how many events the jurisdiction has endured over the past 
uh, let's say 12 months, uh, assistance that it received for those events, um, the unique circumstances of the event itself. So there are a lot of things that will play into whether a jurisdiction is eligible for or should be, receive uh, state assistance for, for the disaster. Any questions on local proclamations? Sure, yeah, go ahead. So for a special district, I understand hey, hey, Bennett. Hey, Bennett. So for a special district, the question I have is, I understand they can't proclaim an, a local emergency under the ESA, and they can't specifically request CDAA that way, but if there was a concentration of damages within a special district, what would be the process you'd be looking for them to kind of raise that up to the next level? Just a strongly worded letter to the OA, uh, a phone call, uh, what would be the process, kind of the best practice you would uh, give for that? Yeah, so um, certainly coordination with the OA. I, I, don't, I won't opine on a strongly worded letter or a non-strongly worded letter, but uh, I would certainly, everything, the way that SEM's structure, the SEM structure exists, and uh, I can look to Eric and, and Ryan as well on this, is that it, it starts local and it builds its way up, and then through the OA, which is the county, and then to the state. So certainly would require coordination with that OA, and um, hopefully we're, we're not waiting until times of disaster to make sure that coordination is happening, that there's an ongoing dialogue, so that way um, in, the, in the event of a situation that impacts a special district, there's already a line of communication through that OA. Is that about right? Ryan shaking his head in the affirmative, so we're good. Eric, uh, who's our former regional administrator as well, knows. But, um, Alex, we're still gonna be looking at that, we're gonna, and maybe you're gonna get into this, we're gonna be looking at that operational area and their budget, even though it's maybe a district specific, we're gonna be looking at budgetary factors of the operational area as a whole. Correct, correct. We wanna we want see all the resources that exist through mutual aid or otherwise that can assist that jurisdiction in any jurisdiction before it rise to the level of or as part of the analysis for state assistance. That's right. So the transition between local proclamations and gubernatorial proclamations. So I'd have to say if it's not, if the disaster isn't something that's readily appar apparent to the state, um, you know, massive fires breaking out, it's consuming thousands of acres to where we, we know uh, immediately that that's gonna trigger a thought to go down the gubernatorial proclamation process. It's imperative upon the county to um, communicate what's going on in, the, in your jurisdiction to your, your regional contacts so they can filter that information up through uh, the regional contacts to the people here so we could make start making that assessment to determine whether um, a gubernatorial proclamation is appropriate for those circumstances. So it's about the, the information sharing and, and the communication between us and, and your emergency um, coordinators. So once it reaches a gubernatorial proclamation, uh, what does that mean? So it's found in uh, Government Code Section 8558, and again, that's under the Emergency Services Act. And a state of emergency means the duly proclaimed existence of conditions of disaster or of extreme peril to, to the safety of persons and property within the state which by reason of their magnitude are or are likely to be on the control of, of the services, personnel, equipment, and facilities of any single county, city, and county, or city, and require the combined forces um, for mutual aid or regions to combat. So it's not too different from the definition of a local proclamation, but this is, you know, as pertaining to a state. And the ESA, um, as we've indicated, empowers the governor to proclaim a state of emergency. And it's for circumstances, of conditions of disaster, extreme peril, as we outlined. And um, the governor is, the, the county can request the governor to proclaim, or the governor finds uh, a local authority um, is beyond its capability to uh, respond to the disaster and feels it's appropriate for the state to proclaim and provide assistance. This, this could be the difference between uh, an event that is a slower moving event, maybe like a storm, or it takes some time to assess damages and the local jurisdiction sort of needs to get a feel for what's out there before they would maybe proclaim and come to the state. Compare that to something like the campfire where, you know, within a matter of minutes, you know, the, the state was aware of how bad that event was and the governor does not need to wait for a local proclamation in order to proclaim and start moving resources. Um, and we, we've seen that in some other events as well, even as recently as a couple weeks ago, where the governor was able to proclaim a, at the very start of an event, uh, anticipating that something was likely to be beyond the capability of a local jurisdiction, which is exactly 
uh, the justification for proclaiming. Once a proclamation happens, it trigger, triggers certain authorities or powers under the ESA, um, broad powers to mitigate effects of a disaster, and uh, the governor then has the ability to issue executive orders following a proclamation. Um, so what does that really mean? He could suspend statute, statutes and regulations. So often uh, the suspensions that we see in a state of emergency, a proclamation for state of emergency is suspending uh, the public contracting code for the state in terms of um, competitive bidding. Um, then there's critical documents, uh, suspensions and waivers, vital records uh, for uh, the waiver of fees for that. Um, he can make, amend, or rescind orders, commandeer private order, uh, private property, and then mission task other state agencies to assist in the uh, response and recovery of uh, any disaster. And that, that authority exists actually without a state of emergency as well. Um, the director of Cal OES is authorized to mission task state agencies um, to maybe prevent or mitigate an anticipated impacts from a disaster. But certainly during a proclaimed emergency, the director here will mission task agencies to do something within their jurisdiction, whether that's you know CHP or Cal uh, Recycle to assist with debris, or DTSC, the Department of Toxic Substance Control to assist with the removal of hazardous household waste. These are all things done via mission task. And then uh, following, as I mentioned, following proclamations, uh, the governor has the authority to issue executive orders, and often you'll see uh, in executive orders, uh, orders that address specific situations in a particular jurisdiction that there, um, that needs needs uh, addressing. So for example, um, one that Alex cites often is during the Napa earthquake, there was a sp suspension, or excuse me, there was, what was it, a suspension yeah. or a waiver of a um, ABC law for operation of um, uh, wine tasting rooms to um, operate Without uh, operate outside the mileage that they're required to, required to um, relative to their their main um, vineyard, so they could uh, maintain a business and and um, build the economy back up following the earthquake. Exactly. Yeah. You know, there there are no two events are are alike, right? There's always some unique circumstance for one or another, and that's like a to me a great example of something that's going to try to help bolster that local economy or mitigate the impact to the economy that that region relies heavily on tourism and it's world renowned and so to the extent there's some accommodation we can make to allow uh, tourists to continue to put money into that area it's it's, it's really important I and mean, that's that's uh, one of the keys to recovery um, is to do something quickly and to buy down that that prolonged um, uh, you know impact from a disaster so here's a kind of a list of just from recent um, executive orders or proclamations, things that you may have seen in either proclamations or executive orders. And the number, the number one thing there, that unemployment insurance, that's specifically called out in the Emergency Services Act. And essentially what it is, is when you apply for uninsurance benefits, typically you have to wait that first week. So you were ineligible for benefits during the first week, and starting week two you can receive benefits. So the governor can waive that one week waiting period, so anybody who is rendered unemployed temporarily or permanently as a result of a disaster can immediately begin um, receiving that benefit. And again, it might seem like a little thing, but having a, a resident of an area have uh, money coming in could help then bolster that local economy and keep, keep that community um, stable. And then as Jennifer mentioned, vital records, so there are the fees to replace vital records that were destroyed, the governor can waive that, uh, the law imposing those fees. Um, state agency contracting, price gouging is automatically triggered upon a proclamation, local and state. Local governing bodies can uh, extend that uh, prohibition on price gouging. Uh, the governor has in certain um, serious events uh, it waived it for longer than a 30 day period at a time. Um, and then uh, waste and debris removal is, is one of the uh, more common waivers when there's uh, a significant number of homes down. Um, the governor would waive uh, rules relating to the disposal of debris so we can quickly move that debris and again restore a community. Um, and then education, following the campfire, we probably had the most uh, disruption to a school district that we probably have ever seen. And uh, in late uh, November, the governor issued a school-specific executive order uh, that cut a ton of red tape and, and was um, kind of showed the state's flexibility and, and, and ability to get students back into classrooms um, quickly. And I think that truly most schools were back and running within a few weeks 
um, whether they were in temporary facilities or whatnot, but at least you have student, minimizing the impacts of students, um, which impacts you know, kids in classrooms, uh, contributes to the funding for the school district, it keeps um, uh, you know, a sense of normalcy for the children who were impacted. So that was a really important and novel executive order that the governor issued. Alex? Yeah. We're actually fortunate today to have the superintendent of the Butte County Office of Education oh, with us today. I wanted to see if Mary <laughs> wanted to say a couple words about that. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good morning, I'm Mary Sukuma, Butte County Superintendent of Schools. And um, the mention here of the extraordinary efforts that Cal OES and so many others um, <clears throat> did on our behalf, the, the actions that you did on our behalf were really incredible. And a couple of examples were, so we had um, two school districts pretty much wiped out, and there was no way that in the case of Paradise Unified that they were going to be able to get back up onto the ridge. Uh, and as it turned out, they weren't able to return until this past August. And so what they ended up doing was standing up schools in places like um, the mall, um, a, a, office building that was near an airport. So not only did the office building not meet the Field Act requirements of uh, a school building, but in addition, we had to get an additional waiver um, because of its proximity to the airport. But those were a couple of examples of just extraordinary things that we were able to do and we did. It was amazing to, to um, be a part of standing up an entire school district again in three weeks, which is essentially what happened with a holiday in between. So anyway, thanks again. So now uh, the California Dis Disaster Assistance Act. So as we previously mentioned, you have to have a local proclamation in order to, uh, valid under the ESA in order to uh, be eligible for disaster assistance under CDAA. And what that is, it provides state financial assistance uh, on a, uh, to a governmental entities or certain private nonprofits um, for eligible emergency uh, activities and public infrastructure work. And uh, CDAA is structured in a way that patterns uh, or the Robert T. Uh, Stafford Act assistance. So you look at, at in, in terms of categories, you have emergency work and you have permanent work. Um, and then approval is based on the totality of circumstances. It's just not one factor, it's a multitude of factors. Uh, including cost of eligible disaster-related da damages per capita indicator, local physical capacity, um, repetitive disasters, and such. And then, uh, oh, and then right at the bottom, I don't know if you could see the link here, but there's a fact sheet on Cal OES website that uh, can be accessed that describes all the factors in more detail. So as I mentioned, um, our public assistance, the disaster assistance, is the categories are broken uh, into emergency work and permanent work. So you have debris removal and emergency protective measures, and then you have permanent work, category C through G. And we'll talk in more detail about that, but as mentioned, it's, it's very much patterned after Stafford Act. So in the event that the uh, disaster transitions into a federal disaster where we received aid, uh, we will be able to easily um, justify those categories for uh, federal assistance. Sure, yeah, so there, uh, just something to note on this, they're split out into emergency work and permanent work, and that's intentional. So on the left side, emergency work, um, only the, the governor can authorize CDAA for emergency work, whereas the director um, theoretically can issue a director's concurrence and award CDAA only for that permanent work on that right side, on that right column. Uh, and then when we get into the Stafford Act, we'll, we'll talk about two types of declarations, emergency and, and disaster. And on emergency declarations, we're only talking about that left side, categories A and B. So we'll, yeah, we, you know, we'll, we'll go through them quickly. I don't, we don't need to go into a ton of detail. I think uh, debris removal for us is probably the most critical. It's the one we spend the most amount of time on. And there are a ton of slides dedicated specifically to debris. So we'll get into that, but um, the gist of it is that debris removal generally is referring to debris on public property and uh, on lands or, that are managed and maintained and owned by the local jurisdiction. We're not talking about private lands here. There are programs for debris removal from private property, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, emergency protective measures, these are all your response costs, uh, mutual aid, 
uh, you know, typically it'll be law enforcement where you're dealing with evacuation and maybe overtime, things like that. These are the, the costs that are associated with these emergency protective measures. Uh, and there are measures implemented to mitigate that immediate threat to public health and safety. So that's that immediate response to a disaster. Hey, Alex, and, oh, if yeah. I could jump in real quick sure. on that. Um, so on, uh, if you could go back to the last slide. So what's important on this category B emergency protective measures uh, for jurisdictions that have received um, a fire management assistance grant, obviously as we transition into the recovery phase, if you've received an FMAG during a firefight, then we are gonna, uh, in, in, as Ryan's team's doing the calculations, we're gonna pull out all of these costs and associate into that FMAG. So when you're looking at your overall cost of the disaster, these emergency protective measures are gonna get tied back to that FMAG in large part. So it's important to understand as you're working with our regional teams, doing your individual damage assessments, looking at the overall cost of the disaster, if you've received an FMAG, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, to understand that those get, those get factored out. They can't be counted twice. And well, yeah, once we get into the federal side, there's not a slide on it, but I will uh, explain what an FMAG is. So um, just breezing through the categories here, C are roads and bridges. Uh, similar to offsetting costs for uh, FMAG, um, if, an, if a road is eligible for Federal Highway Administration costs, then those are gonna be backed out of the calculation towards your total, uh, whether or not, and that'll, that'll play into whether or not the state is eligible for federal assistance, and I'll get into those thresholds in just a bit. Uh, category D, water control facilities. Likewise, if it's subject to the jurisdiction of another federal agency, then FEMA will not fund it. Um, so, for instance, if it's in an Army Corps program, uh, then that's what's going to provide funding for any damage. Uh, water control facilities, utilities, uh, and then parks, rec, and other facilities. So those are, the, those are all the categories of assistance. So what happens right after a disaster? Um, the local jurisdiction has to verify its damages, and this is really where Ryan's team uh, comes into play. He's got a, a team of emergency service coordinators and um, disaster assistance specialists that get deployed into the field and, and essentially embed with local jurisdictions to assess these damages. And so what a local a jurisdiction would first do is assess damages and enter it into uh, Web EOC or Cal EOC, I believe it's called. Um, and then the state will help validate these damages. And it's that validation that's critical because that's what ultimately determines the level of agreed upon damages. If we're dealing with a potential federal event, uh, the federal government will be part of that team. So it's state, local, and fed. They'll all assess the damages, come up with an agreed upon amount for uninsured losses to public facilities, put them into each category of assistance that we just talked about, and that becomes the PDA, the preliminary damage assessment, and that is what drives the uh, request for public assistance in a major disaster declaration, which we'll get into. But that's key, absent an, a, uh, an accurate and thorough assessment of damages, at your level, we won't as a state, and the feds won't as, as the federal government, know whether uh, assistance is warranted. So this is, this is absolutely critical. And uh, when we're talking about a federal event, we're on a tight timeline to make a request unless we request an extension. So the sooner you can access, the, access these areas to, to validate damages, the better. Uh, now, un we understand there's some areas that might be inaccessible due to flood or snow or something like that. And that could justify uh, a request for an extension of time from the federal government. But we need to operate under the assumption that there will be no extension and that we'll have validated damages uh, very soon after an event. Um, okay, we talked about this as well, that uh, the director can issue CDA for permanent work, the governor can issue for either emergency or permanent work, uh, and um, who's eligible to proclaim under the ESA. I, I should know that for every now and then, from time to time, it comes up whether an incorporated town is included in the definition of city, so that's why we threw that definition. Um, I think it's come up twice or three times since I've been here, so just something to know. So, um, it, our CDA regs essentially mirror the federal government's uh, regs on, on, uh, for public assistance. And this is a really critical slide right here. Um, under, if it's a state-only event, the requirement is that you follow your own rules. However, um, <laughs> The federal procurement rules, which we'll talk about in a bit, are very, very stringent, especially for local governments, more so than state governments. And they're tricky, and it's um, the number one um, uh, point for deobligation or finding from the OIG if they come into audit. So procurement is absolutely critical. 
our regs actually say that to the extent that there may be federal funding available, uh, a local jurisdiction must follow the federal procurement rules. Uh, and so what happens for a local government is that you have to follow your rules and the federal regs, and to the extent there's a conflict, you must follow the more restrictive or more difficult uh, rule to follow. It's really tricky. Uh, and so when FEMA does their presentations, they'll actually give examples of you know, which is more restrictive, and it's, it's really difficult sometimes to even figure that out. Um, but, but that's a critical component of post-disaster recovery because um, any defect in contractor procurement is going to put you at a disadvantage should there be an audit. Uh, so that's why we recommend that you follow the federal rules. And then generally, um, the, the cost share for CDA, if you're granted that, is 75%, which means that the local jurisdiction will bear the 25% non-state share of CDAA. So it's a pretty simple calculation. It gets a little trickier if we're dealing with federal funds. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that in just a bit. So uh, I've got a couple pictures before we get into debris removal, but uh, you can see the picture on the slide right now is Coffee Park before and after uh, the 2017 North Bay fires. It's a pretty powerful picture uh, if you take a look. Um, the next slide that you're going to see here, this is a staging area following the 2017 North Bay fires of burnt vehicles. Um, thousands and thousands of vehicles that, are, that were burnt, they're essentially shells of a vehicle that were staged um, so that the crews could remove actual structural debris from properties. But to me, that picture is pretty telling. You can't even really tell what vehicles, when one starts and another begins. And we're talking about this on a scale of thousands and thousands of vehicles. And then here's just a close-up picture of a of one vehicle on a property. This is from 2015 uh, um, in Lake County, the Valley Fire. Sure, so a debris removal from publicly and privately owned lands and waters undertaken by the state um, in response to an emergency is eligible for state financial assistance. Um, private property debris removal may be authorized when there's an immediate threat to public health and safety. And the, the critical thing to take away from that statement is that it needs to be um, a threat to public health because um, the state does not typically go into private properties and remove the debris. That's typically incumbent upon the uh, landowner and it has to be an extraordinary circumstance for the government to come in and do a pub private, public, private property Story removal, excuse me, I'm stumbling over my words today. Um, and then that often um, will necessitate a, a proclamation from your local health officer about the threat to public health. Um, and then there's the assessment of whether the state needs to come in and assist in that manner. And so the CDA regulations talk about debris removal and then talk about private property debris removal. And the default rule is that uh, removal of debris from private property is ineligible for CDA. So that is the default rule, right? We're only talking about public property. The exception is if there are circumstances that are so severe, perhaps a, a, you know, a high concentration of homes that were burnt in a certain area, maybe impacting a watershed, or um, just the sheer volume of debris poses a threat to the public at large, then the state could consider authorizing reimbursement for debris removal from private property. Same with the federal government, we'll go into their criteria in a minute. But the key there is that it's still a reimbursement program just like any project under CDAA. So the default is if we authorize it, then the local jurisdiction could engage in a private property debris removal and submit for reimbursement. Only when there are truly extraordinary, the worst of the worst sort of events, would the state come in and actually, uh, in the form of like a direct state assistance, remove that debris. So. Um, it's really critical that jurisdictions understand the scope of PPDR, what the rules are, and build a local capability um, to actually engage in this sort of a program uh, because uh, most events would not warrant uh, the state to actually come in and, and do that. And while we can provide technical assistance, it's really important that the local jurisdictions understand what it takes to run a debris uh, removal program. Yeah, and should the, the locals undertake such a program, the, the regulations require that the local jurisdiction secure a right of entry form, meaning that they are authorized to go into the private property and remove that debris. And within that right of entry form, there needs to be a hold harmless agreement uh, by, 
from the, the owner of the property to the local jurisdiction and the state saying that the local and the state are absolved of any liability or negligence or damage to the property. And then the local jurisdictions have, or the, excuse me, and then the private property, or the private, oh God, the owner, the homeowner, um, uh, and the local jurisdiction needs to avoid duplication of benefits. So uh, overview of private property debris removal, there are both state and federal programs that could allow this. It is actually considered public assistance, it's not individual assistance. Reason being is that the justification for, um, for engaging in that kind of a program is that there's a threat to the public at large and you need to remove that debris to mitigate that threat to the public at large. So this is not considered individual assistance under either the state or the fed um, programs. As Jennifer mentioned, you need a right of entry, indemnification and hold harmless. And there's a spot on the existing ROE uh, right of entry template that we've all used that has a spot for insurance, but it'll be the local jurisdiction's obligation to pursue um, insurance proceeds because uh, those would constitute a duplication of benefits. And that's a requirement both in the state and the federal programs. Um, there, we typically get a lot of questions when these programs are rolled out. There are town hall meetings and people say, well, will, this, will I owe money? Is this, am I gonna be out of pocket for this? The short answer is no, um, but your insurance proceeds, the, the government will, would take your insurance proceeds to the extent there are insurance proceeds earmarked for debris and remaining after um, the, the debris removal has happened. Um, now, homeowners would be able to use that debris insurance proceeds for things that are not covered uh, under the debris program, but if they have no other expenses and there are funds on the policy earmarked for debris, then sure, the government would collect that back. And typically, it's gonna be cents on the dollar uh, compared to the cost of the debris removal. Um, so it's not an out-of-pocket, but it is a recoupment of money from the insurance policy. Um, and then in order to get private property debris removal requests to us, you'll have to demonstrate that there is an immediate threat to public health and safety. Um, under the federal gui guidelines, there's gotta be some sort of cognizant official that can make that determination. It almost always is the local health officer, and it's always done via a local health emergency under Health and Safety Code 101080. Um, and this is critical. It's, it's a way that, because you know, we are not uh, um, health experts, right? We're gonna rely on those health experts. So if there's a, a local health officer that is proclaiming the existence of a health emergency due to the volume of hazardous debris, then that's gonna carry weight in our evaluation. And one of the bases as well could be economic recovery. Uh, so it, it could be that you need to remove that debris, for instance, to restore um, the economy, or the local economy in that jurisdiction. And that's gonna be one of the factors that will weigh into whether or not that program's approved. So things to consider, local considerations when you're undertaking a private property debris removal uh, program is um, having, having taken the steps prior to the disaster occurring of having uh, contractors in place or potential contractors in place for the debris removal program. Um, and then um, when, you're, when you're responding to the actual emergency and undertaking the debris removal, sometimes debris ordinances are necessary. So the ordinances need to be consistent with, um, with the public health emergency and the threat to the environment and, um, and make sure that your, the local jurisdictions are uh, not allowing uh, individual property owners to re-enter into the, uh, the areas that are deemed a threat to the public before the debris is actually removed from the property. And then, um, of course, as Alex mentioned, the insurance collection that we have to avoid the duplication of, of benefits. You know. um, yeah, that should be, yeah, that should do, essentially what you wanna do is in that ordinance, you're gonna identify a, typically a timeline by which a uh, homeowner who does not want to participate in the consolidated government run program to opt out, do their own cleanup, but they're gonna be strict timelines that the homeowner would need to clean by and um, the local jurisdiction must be ready to abate properties that have not complied. So if you have a homeowner that has left property there and it's potentially uh, posing that threat to, to public health and safety or watershed, uh, they're gonna be subject to abatement. Question? The question, the question was, has Cal OES oh. provided 
templates of those ordinances or provide like recommendations on, on good ones to emulate? So I don't know if we've officially provided them. We have we have just over the years worked with jurisdictions. So I do have act, I do have uh, many of them. We we have our own kind of um, guidebook that we sort of rely on, uh, and certainly able to share that. In fact. Following the 2017 North Bay fires, we had it started as daily calls, and then every other day, and then a couple days a week, and then weekly calls with every either county council or city attorney of an impacted jurisdiction. So there was like 15 folks on the call every day talking through all of these issues, ordinances. And then uh, in the car fire, which was uh, July of 2018, um, county council and city attorney for Reading worked with Sonoma, because they had just gone through it less than a year earlier. And then this year, working with Butte County, I know that. Um, their county council had worked with Sonoma. So uh, certainly there is this sort of neighbor helping neighbor approach on the legal side as well. Uh, and I'm happy to share any template. Those are all right, and ordinances public. So happy to share any of that that would be useful to a jurisdiction. But that, I think that's a, that's a key, that coordination and, and uh, collaboration with folks who have gone through it is key on any disaster. Eric? Um, Alex, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody um, Sherry McCracken is in the room with us today, and she's got plenty of templates that I'm sure she'd be happy to share with all of you, as I'm sure Reva would as well. Um, so certainly looking to, to the folks that have been through it. I think one of the other things I wanted to touch on, and I'm sure Ryan will touch on this a little bit further when he speaks, is to help everybody to understand that our ability at the state level or the federal government level to do debris operations is not unlimited. So. We are going to look at, there are not clear cut defined thresholds on when we will be able to come in and do debris removal. Um, so that's something that we will look at is what is your capability, understanding that we will throw all the technical expertise and experience to your team to help you. But we certainly want to see California as a whole get to a point where there's a greater capability at the local government level to do these debris management operations, understanding that those very large operations like in 17 and 18, where the ability to get a community back on its feet quickly requires sometimes the state or federal government to come in. But there's a lot of events that we deal with that are a much smaller universe. And so that's a conversation we need to collaboratively have before there's the expectation that the state or federal government's gonna come in and take care of that. Thanks, Eric. And to put in perspective of just the sheer scale of some of these disasters, so in 2015, we had a federally declared event, uh, 4240, which encompassed the Butte Fire in Calaveras, Amador counties, the Valley Fire in Lake County. Collectively, between those two massive fires, we had just under 2,000 homes destroyed. North Bay fires in 2017, we were over 6,000. And in uh, the Camp Fire alone in, in uh, Paradise, we were talking over 18,000 structures. So when we talk about the threat to public health and safety, it's not a few hundred homes. Um, we're talking thousands of homes that literally blanketed an entire community with hazardous debris. And it's that sort of a um, justification that would allow private property debris removal with public funding, if that makes sense, right? It's not just a few homes scattered. It is a high concentration, widespread um, public threat. Um. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're really going to explore emergency declarations and major disaster declarations. But it's noteworthy that there's also another um, uh, assistance available under the Stafford Act, and that's FMAS, or uh, Fire Management Assistant Grant, grant Declarations. And that, that is triggered when there is a fire happening and it re re reaches such a significant uh, threat threshold that uh, the, the federal government is willing to lean in and, and provide assistance Real quick, noteworthy on the FMAG, sorry. You have one shot to request that thing. And so you have to, there's gotta be an event that looks, that, that could warrant a major disaster deck if the fire burnt the way it does, but you can't wait uh, and, and you know, until after the fire is burnt to request that. And the whole idea is that they'll provide this assistance to mitigate that, what would otherwise potentially be that major disaster declaration. And typically those requests are verbal over the phone and then the paperwork follows after, after the request is made and and the uh, verbal approval is uh, provided. So, um, like I said, emergency declarations and major disaster decla declarations, those declarations authorize the president to provide supplemental federal assistance. And um, 
the amount and system scope is dependent upon the two declarations. So an emergency declaration, any occasion or instance for which in the determination of the president, federal assistance is needed to supplement state and local efforts and capabilities to save lives and to protect property, public health and safety, um, or to the lesser or avert the threat of a catastrophe to any part of the United States. Um, so as we covered earlier in the, the chart, we have, um, if you remember the two charts, you had the debris removal and emergency protective measures, and then you had the emergency work. So here we're looking at the, the emergency protective measures and the debris removal on that left side of the chart. Um, yeah, so typically these come at the front end of a disaster or shortly before a disaster. You see these a lot on the East Coast as a hurricane is coming in and they know it's gonna come and they, they can kind of time it and they'll re maybe request an emergency declaration ahead of time so they can receive some sort of emergency protective measures to mitigate that threat. California, unfortunately, is a no-notice state for the most part. Uh, once in a while, we'll have a really bad weather event like we saw a couple weeks ago where um, there was it was pretty certain that there were gonna be fires during that really severe fire weather condition. We also saw the, um, the near failure of the Oroville Dam spillway. That was the first emergency declaration, at, at least in my tenure here, that we secured. Um, just given the mass amount of folks who were evacuating at one time, uh, the, obviously the potential catastrophe that would have occurred had that failed. Um, and then we've had a few since when there were mass evacuations or really bad fire, campfire for instance, we were able to secure one of these just to get additional firefighting assets or commodities for shelters uh, when you knew that there were gonna be a lot of folks displaced. But for the most part, these are, these are more rare than what Jennifer's about to talk about. And then a, a major disaster declaration, um, of course it's defined for you up there, but it's uh, any natural catastrophe uh, regardless of the cause, and it's of such uh, magnitude to warrant assistance under the Stafford Act from, from the uh, President and the federal government. So this is the type of assistance that's available under the major disaster declaration. So if you can um, think back to the chart that we set forth for you under CDAA, this starts mirroring those categories as well. So you have emergency you have the left side, the emergency work, and then you also have permanent work. But what's also significant for major disaster declarations is that you have individuals available under major disaster declarations. So it includes um, housing, mass care and sheltering, emergency assistance, crisis, crisis counseling, counseling, a disaster unemployment assistance, and the like. And then, of course, um, there's the hazard, hazard mitigation The way that the HMGP program works is uh, the state receives back, depending on um, the calculation, either 15 or 20 cents on the dollar of every dollar that uh, constituted that major disaster declaration. So uh, on, a, on a billion dollar event, you're talking about $150 million or 200 million that comes back to the state in the form of a hazard mitigation grant that any local jurisdiction could apply for. It, it does not, it's not limited to just the jurisdiction where the event was declared. So it's statewide. Uh, it's a really tremendous program that we administer here. It's federal dollars that go back to the locals to ideally build a capability to mitigate harm from a future event. So uh, hopefully you folks are familiar. If not, I would definitely become familiar. Ryan will be your point on this, but it's a, it's a really uh, important program. Um, so when we, there are two, two uh, different analyses that occur for public assistance and individual assistance. Public assistance generally is gonna be driven by the, the cost of the event. So uh, California's indicator is somewhere around $57 million of uninsured public infrastructure damages from an event. It's a really, really high number, highest in the nation uh, given our population. Um, and so this is where I'm talking about where the local jurisdictions must identify these damages and get concurrence from the state and the federal government on the cost of the to repair or replace. So what happens is the state has to reach approximately $57 million in order to, to, to be eligible for a major disaster declaration. In addition, each county that we're seeking to have included in that major declaration must meet their own indicator. 
So you could have a situation where the state gets in with a $57 million threshold, but included in that $57 million are a couple of counties whose numbers contribute towards that total, but did not meet their individual indicators. And that happens once in a while, especially with larger counties that have really, really high thresholds, per capita thresholds. Individual assistance is a totally different analysis. Uh, there is no preset number that you have to hit in order to get there. I think in the past, we've looked at 800 to 1200 homes as sort of the, uh, a rough minimum, and then you kind of have to sell why it's, it's justified. So there could be concentration of damages, trauma to the, uh, to the um, uh, community, uh, socioeconomic status of the community, all those types of things contribute. Just recently though, FEMA updated its criteria and um, they have a new formula that's based on total taxable resources of the state uh, in California that increased the, the indicator or the threshold theoretically for, um, for individual assistance. We have not requested individual assistance since this rule came into effect. I think it was just this past spring. So June, yeah. So um, we have yet to see really what that difference is, but we certainly are aware of recent events that um, may not have had the same uh, outcome if we're, base, if we're calculating it with this new criteria. So this is something we're watching very closely. Hopefully uh, we don't need to request anything because we have a, a nice, uh, I don't wanna use the Q word, but uh, I'll say it's quiet sort of time for California. But, um, but we'll see what happens when, um, when we make our next request for that. Yeah. Just to give everybody an example, the Napa earthquake would not have been declared under this new criteria. A lot of the flooding events earlier this spring would not have been declared under this new criteria. So these are things that were declared. Campfire 2017, that was iffy, uh, if that would have met the metric, at least in the, in the early stages. So what Alex is saying is uh, this has potential huge complications for the state. Yeah. And I, I know that folks are talking generally, not just in California, that it's sort of brand new. We'll see how it all uh, works, but certainly something to keep an eye on. Um, so the federal debris removal program, similar to what Jennifer was talking about on the state side, um, there are, there's got to be a, a showing, a demonstration that there's an immediate threat to public health and safety. Um, and then also they'll take into account economic, reco uh, economic recovery uh, as a basis for approving that kind of a program. Again, it's public assistance, not individual assistance, and they require the rights of entry and that you avoid duplication of benefits. So duplication of benefits can be in many forms. Most commonly, it's gonna be insurance. Uh, so when you're running a debris program, uh, every homeowner theoretically would have insurance, or most will, and most of those will also have debris coverage. And so that's where um, a lot of your efforts are gonna be focused. But there could be other programs as well that constitute duplication. So if you have a flood control facility that's under Army Corps, like I mentioned, that would be uh, ineligible. Um, and then recently, we're kind of seeing this play out, but there, there is also provision in the, in the uh, Stafford Act regulations that, const that that's, says a negligent third party that caused the condition for which disaster funding was expended would constitute a, a, a duplication of benefits and that there is an obligation of the local uh, government to pursue those costs uh, from a negligent third party, so. And we, we being the state of California in the CDAA regs have a companion regulation that requires the same thing, that you have to pursue a negligent third party and you have to cooperate with the state to um, try to obtain um, any insurance as a result of the negligence of a third party. And it, it, it very much patterns the, the federal regulation, so. Yeah, and this is a, that's a heavy lift. I mean, if we're talking, you know, 15,000 homes or 14,000, whoever, however many opted in, and pursuing insurance proceeds from every one of those uh, homeowners, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. Some jurisdictions contract out that task to a subrogation firm, um, and that could be eligible, it could be an eligible expense towards the disaster as well. Um, but before you undertake that, obviously coordinate with us, and if it's a federal event uh, with FEMA as well, and we'll make sure that everybody's on the same page. And then uh, the cost share, so generally when federal assistance comes in, it's at 75, 25% cost share rate, uh, and then we, the state, will kick in 75% of the 25% with CDAA funding. So the way that the breakdown typically will look is 75% from the federal government, 18.75% from the state, and then the local jurisdiction would have six and a quarter percent as their cost share. 
So uh, as I mentioned, the, probably the number one um, finding with, with audits, and maybe Ryan could confirm this, is relating to procurement and contracting. Uh, again, it's very complicated it's, and it's very important. On the left, um, the state has it relatively easy. The state follows its own contracting rules and has to include a, a series of contractual provisions that are set forth in the regulations. On the right side of that column, um, it's, a, it's a lot more tricky. So for local government, you have to follow your, your local rules to the extent there are state rules that apply to you, you follow those, and you follow 2 CFR 200.318 through 326. And when your councils are reviewing these, to the extent that there's anything between 318 and 326 that conflicts with the local rule, you have to compare them, dedupe them, and follow the more strict uh, path. So it's a, it's a really uh, tricky, difficult thing, but it's important. And you don't want to be in the business of giving money back that you receive from, a, from for disasters. Um, so that's key. And I would also say, I should have said this during debris, debris is probably the most complicated and costly uh, part of a recovery operation. And there are obviously contracts that are affiliated with those things. So your debris contracts, uh, it's a double whammy. It's, it's, a, it's a highly, highly, um, uh, well, it's a high price tag on the debris. Procurement's always going to be audited, and uh, debris contracts will always have some scrutiny. So make sure that those things are solid, that you've vetted them through your council, and that you've complied with the procurement rules uh, under the uh, Stafford Act regulations. And then when there's, when there's not a federal event, or sorry, like a major disaster or an emergency deck, there are still other types of programs that you can seek relief from through the federal government, and that's run through our office. So one could be the Small Business Administration. You can get low-interest loans for businesses and, and homeowners. And then uh, the U.S. Department of Ag has uh, disaster programs that will provide funding for lost crops or something that resulted from an event that did not warrant uh, necessarily a, um, a major disaster declaration. This could still be on the table uh, as assistance. And then we talked about the uh, hazard mitigation. Again, a really critical program that we administer that uh, gives money right back to you all to uh, build uh, you know, better capabilities and, and to be able to withstand future disasters. So in the last uh, several years, Cal OES has really put its mission to work. We've seen an extraordinary amount of emergency uh, proclamations, uh, presidential emergency declarations, and major disaster de declarations. So here's some statistics um, that we've that we've uh, used or met, if you will, uh, unfortunately, um, and. You know, we've all been extremely busy responding to the disasters over the last seven years. So we've had 11 major disaster decks, five presidential emergencies, 75 plus gubernatorial uh, state of emergencies um, based upon the timeline set up there. And then we've seen firestorms, earthquakes, disease outbreaks, gas leaks, air attempts, drought, and many more. Yeah, so definitely, um, you know, no two events are alike. There's always something new. There's no shortage of of uh, disasters that strike California. I want to just point to a few things. One, that 75 plus gubernatorial, it's sort of a misleading number. The numbers of events is way higher than that um, because that's, that'll be like one proclamation. Within one proclamation, you could have a dozen fires that are listed out. Even a couple weeks, or two weeks ago, we had the Tick and the Kincaid fires, two separate events, obviously different counties, but within one proclamation. So that's an example of one proc equals two events. Uh, or at least two separate fires, and that, that goes on uh, through most of these. And if you look at the recent trend, nine out of the 11 pro, uh, presidential disaster decks were in the past two and a half years, and all five emergency decks that we've seen, at least since 2014, have been in that same time period. So certainly a, a pretty, um, pretty busy time for, for all of us folks here. So speaking of things that are, we're always seeing new in, in events, does anybody know what that is? Fire NATO, right. So in, 20, in 2018, July 2018, in the car fire, there was actually, um, what, I mean, it's called a fire whirl. I think it was uh, referred to as a fire NATO or a fire tornado. But so evidently within fires, you can have it's essentially weather systems or winds that, that are created within the fire itself. And this is one that, um, that occurred in the campfire, or in the car fire, rather, in, in 2018. And, National Weather Service officially designated this as a fire world with uh, wind speeds equivalent to an EF3 tornado, 140 plus mile an hour winds within a fire. And you actually had damage within that, uh, within that 
fire parameter, you had wind damage to homes that were not necessarily burned the way that neighboring homes would have been, but damaged nonetheless as if it was a catastrophic tornado. When we requested that major disaster declaration, it was actually approved for two types of events. There was, it was a fire event and a wind event, and they looked at them separately because there were, there were damages attributed just to that wind. Um, so, you know, it's not just, we're not just saying that when we say, you know, you never know what you'll see and there's, and no two events are alike. This was certainly something that I hadn't worked on before and it was novel to me. Um, so kind of a, kind of a, a telling tale of, of what we're seeing in these past few years. And then this is our contact information, uh, Jennifer and me. So if you have any questions down the road, always feel free to email or call um, and happy to take questions now or hang out uh, for after the other presentation. So we are uh, ahead of schedule. We're gonna take a, a 15 minute uh, restroom break and uh, allow folks to get coffee and refreshments on the side of the room. But we've got more than enough time for questions right now for Alex and Jennifer. So if you've got questions for them. I don't have a question, but I have to say thank you, Alex. I think we've put you through the ringer uh, with the campfire. And I have to tell you, it is so important to have your counsel working with Alex and his crew um, and stay in lockstep because we weren't in the beginning. I think we are now, though. So thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions in the room? OK. Then we're going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, let's come back here at around 9.35. The restrooms, for anybody that needs them, are directly behind us in the hall. There's also a, a filter water dispenser out there. If you've got a water bottle that you want to refill, you can do that out there. And we'll be back here around 9.35. Thanks, everyone. We're going to start our uh, afternoon group. Uh, it's going to start with Ryan Beerus, our Deputy Director of Recovery, and then transition over uh, to some perspective from both city and county level uh, from 2018. Uh, but we're gonna start first with Ryan Beerus, our Deputy Director of Recovery, who I think is only about six months on the job with us, uh, who uh, brings to Cal OES and the state of California a phenomenal experience from the federal side uh, in terms of disaster recovery. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan. Thank you. First off, I have not been here for even four months. Uh, July 22nd was my first date. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I do have a lot of experience on the federal side. Uh, I was with FEMA for over a decade, uh, worked in uh, recovery and front office, and uh, I, was in, I was deployed in the field probably 80% of the time, so including working the 2017 and 18 wildfires here in California as the housing lead um, uh, for FEMA, working alongside Eric uh, and others from the state. I liked it so much, I chose the better pr uh, profession coming here to work for California, so it's my honor to be here. And I can say the people here and working with many of people in the room, like Sherry and others, has been a joy. You don't really get that when you have that FEMA shirt on. Uh, you get a def you, you know, definitely get a different response when you go into counties and cities. Uh, but before I uh, go into just what I know, um, for 2017 and 18 and some lessons learned. I am gonna turn it over to my Assistant Director for Recovery Operations, Grady Joseph. He has to leave at 10 o'clock and I just wanted him to speak some on some of the technology uh, things that we're looking at for the state. So, Grady. Uh, good afternoon, good morning everybody, sorry. <laughs> Still getting uh, used to the, the time change. I was on the East Coast all weekend. So. Um, anyway, what I wanted to kind of chat with you guys a little bit about today, um, you know, Ryan's been here for about four months, I've been here for a little over two months, and, and what we both worked on uh, primarily well, on the federal side was an effort to make sure that we have data interoperability across jurisdictions, right? So, um, you know, when we're looking at it from a national perspective, we've got uh, 50 states, obviously about 3,500 counties. Um, 16 territories and over 400 tribes in the United States of America. Um, so we want to get to a place where we can begin capturing data once and reusing that throughout the rest of the recovery process. So that starts up at the initial damage assessment, our estimate. So um, what we have been attempting to kind of put into place uh, since we've been here, we've done two IDEs since I've been here, uh, the most recent one being for the Kincaid fire in Sonoma. Um, 
we want to get to a place where we can gather information at the first touch with the locals, with you guys, um, and give you guys the ability to capture that data as well so that we can then move that into, say, public assistance, and individual assistance, right? So if we've gone out with the SBA and done an assessment of a home and noted that that's been destroyed, we have imagery that, suge that supports that, uh, we have all the requisite information, why should we not just be able to roll that directly into housing assistance through the SBA or FEMA's individual assistance program when that comes into play. Um, so we're really trying to get better and focus on areas where we can improve how we do our operations. Um, that goes into you know everything from the IDE side of, all the way out to um, you know when you folks are asking for disbursements for your PA grants, right? We want to be able to cut down the amount of touches and the amount of paperwork that you all have to contend with um, because we believe in you know first and foremost making sure that the customer experience, you guys are the customers for us, right? Uh, we want to make sure that that's as efficient as effective as possible. So um, more to come on that as we kind of get our you know get our feet wet um, with the different recovery operations and begin to build on that. But that is somewhere something that we're definitely moving towards. Uh, so we want to be a lot more predictive. We want to be a lot more um, you know conscious of your time and, and energy and whatnot, and basically free up resources so that we all collectively can focus on the recovery and making sure that we're making the best decisions for local communities as, as they begin to recover. Um, so with that, any questions on kind of where we want to go and, and where we've been? Uh, Ryan and I both worked on the, the modernizing of the public assistance program. Um, so that's been kind of a big focus for us. And then uh, we did damage assessment assessments nationally as well. So um, really just trying to bring those lessons learned and, and those experiences into California and um, ideally improve business processes uh, for the entire state to make everything a little bit more effective for us. Thank you. So I really have nothing prepared because I read Alex's uh, brief yesterday and I was like, well, I don't even need to speak on recovery because he just covered it for you all. So if there's any questions on recovery, ask Alex. He's got us covered. Um, I'm going to talk just some lessons learned real quick, uh, at least lessons that we at the state learned or I learned personally. Um, the path forward of how I plan on leading uh, the recovery team uh, here in the uh, states working closely with everyone in this room. And Reva, I actually owe you a visit from our meeting a couple of months ago. I did not forget that. Um, I've been telling Pune we need to get to Malibu, and why would we not want to go there? So uh, I am working on that. Um, and then I want to turn it over to Pune, who uh, leads my uh, uh, interagency recovery coordination uh, uh, division. I think this is going to be the future of, of um, of how we approach disasters, particularly with, you know, Alex just mentioned IA may be a little more difficult to get. Uh, PA, uh, $57 million is a large threshold, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not assistance out there. So we have this team with six RSFs and she's gonna kind of go over that. And for the first time ever, I'm sure Sherry, I've seen your slides too, but if you could just mention some things about the recovery support functions in your experience, good and or bad, I would like for everyone to hear it, including myself. Um, so I went to the NEMA conference um, two or three weeks ago in Idaho, and we were at the R and R session, and it was an hour and a half long. And I don't know how many people were in the room. It was quite a few. And FEMA was talking individual assistance, and then they were like, you know, this is the, these are our metrics. I'll just to give you some metrics. Which well, one metric that they mentioned, which was alarming to me, their metric for sheltering is 14 days. If anybody's still in shelters after 14 days, they get alarming, or they get alarmed, or they say the county or city can't handle it, the state needs help. Apparently, they've never, ever responded to a fire. Because uh, a fire is months, we just, well, a year in this case, uh, having shelters open. So uh, that was one thing they mentioned. They also mentioned housing, of how their housing program, they're going to bring in all these travel trailers and mobile homes and they want to be innovative, but they really can't. Um, so, uh, but once again, they have never worked fires. Uh, they've never worked mudslides. They've never apparently visited the state of California uh, because lots are small, uh, space is uh, precious, uh, and there's different codes here. Uh, for instance, when they were bringing in the manufactured homes and 
Luckily, I already left this disaster as a Fed December 21st because of the shutdown, because if not, it would be my fault. But they brought in mobile homes that never even met the state or local code. So when you go into a sales program at the end of this, hopefully maybe giving somebody a potential use of a unit, they can't even purchase it because it doesn't even meet code. That's a big lessons learned. We should never accept anything, Alex, um, in the future that doesn't meet our code. And you were probably not even aware of that, probably uh, those, uh, those are discussions. Um, another thing with shelters we've learned is all the pop-up shelters. Nationally, this is a problem, but particularly with uh, 17 and 18, you know, we had the Walmart uh, uh, pop-up shelter here, and that creates its own coordination uh, effort. Several churches were popped up. This recent incident uh, in, for the Kincaid fire, we had some of our subcontractors open up their base camp um, um, to sheltering, which we quickly had to intervene and make sure that they went to the proper sheltering. So that's one thing, a big lesson learned is every, in the end, everybody wants to help, right? But uh, coordinating that and not going to those assigned shelters uh, does become problematic uh, in large um, uh, events. Debris, I haven't really seen it in 17 and 18, I don't, but particularly in floods, and we are prone to flooding events here in the state. We just have to watch out. There's a lot of uh, uh, scam orders that come out for debris, particularly the muck up. Um, so that's one thing, um, and, we, and we've seen some of it in 17, not too much in 18, uh, people trying to clean up uh, at the dime of somebody that just lost uh, everything, which is sad. Another lesson learned from 17 to 18, um, I don't know if I could say it, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, we do it, when it comes to a federal cleanup, I think we do it better uh, than the feds. Um, we, in 18, we not only were quicker, uh, we also did it cheaper um, by several hundred thousand dollars per parcel. Uh, and I think that's just to, to, to the testament of not only Cal OES, but also working with the county. The county has been great in the uh, town. The, the ROEs is a big lessons learned. I mean, Sherry can definitely speak to it when she mentions it, but you know, Sherry had, she's the county, then you have the town of Paradise, and who's gonna control that ROE process? Who's gonna set up those, those uh, ROE, ROE centers? How many town halls do you have to have to get all these ROEs in? And she received over 11,000, I think it was 809 to be exact, ROEs um, um, uh, in a pretty quick time frame. So, uh, but that's, that's the nature of, of uh, cleanup, ROEs are critical. And we're doing it round two with trees. Uh, that was another lesson learned, I think, um, but particularly up north, not so much down south, Bennett, but you know, when you have a debris cleanup, you have all these trees that were burned down, that's still part of the, a potential right away. Early on though, we didn't really capture all of that with the ROEs and didn't have that language. We didn't have it approved, so now we have to go into phase uh, two of the cleanup, which I don't know if it would have changed the time frame of the cleanup, but it would have definitely prevented round two of collecting right of entries, which uh, is uh, just never, never fun. Alex mentioned the debris uh, cleanup, uh, but you know, we picked up in 17, 3.6 million, exceeded 3.6 million tons of debris already. I mean, that's, uh, uh, it's more than the World Trade Center uh, by double. Uh, it's almost 600,000 elephants for those that can visualize that. <laughs> and the reason I mention that is I reviewed 12 debris management plans from counties and a lot of people have this notion of where they're gonna put the debris. And I think you just have to visualize that many elephants. And then when you write your plan, see if those elephants fit where that's going. Um, on housing, nobody wants to talk about housing, even pre-event. Uh, we have a housing crisis in, in the state. We have affordable housing problem in the state. And when you lose 14,000 homes like Sherry did, or Coffee Park, that was, I think, 1,500 homes. Uh, you have to talk housing. Um, when, when we do have an IA incident, uh, like we will if it's 2,000 plus, I think the metric's 2,500 now, just to let y'all know. It used to be 800, I think it's 2,500 now. Um, is, you know, you're gonna quickly have people talking or coming to you about being innovative, and setting all these new things up in these, I don't know what you call them, mini houses. Uh, um, 
What's it? Tiny homes, yes. You know, when they come with you, a big book, and they say, hey, not only you can have this tiny home, then you can build your house, and then you can rent the home, and then you go to the county, they're like, what? I'm not permitted <laughs> uh, for that. So it sounds good. Um, but all of that is, you can't really do that post-incident. Um, you have the ones that want to do the 4D type homes. They want to, they have this module that they can go rent this or buy this empty building and have all these 3D plannings and quickly do things, which they've never done before. Um, what I'm trying to get at is this has to be all done pre-incident. Uh, Post-incident, there's three things you can do. And this is as it, it, and you, within the confines of being innovative. These, this is housing. You can buy it, you can build it, or you can repair it. That's the three things you can do in housing. So when you lose something, when you lose everything, you're not buying anything. All these other programs you hear about, family, multifamily repair. Well, it's burned to the ground. We didn't, there's really nothing to repair. Uh, they want to, uh, at the time, we had a step program, which you can shelter in place, which they removed, which I'm convinced we will have it in the incident of an uh, earthquake, but there's nothing to live in. Um, that's another big program for uh, FEMA. The federal programs for housing are built for floods. It's built for a hurricane. It's built for the Gulf Coast. It's built to where something can come in, the water exceeds, the wind dies down, you put up a trailer, you muck and build your house, uh, and the trailer leaves in six months. That's what the federal housing programs are for. If you haven't been to a housing mission before, it's the most political thing uh, you will ever get involved in. It's the most personal thing you will ever get involved in. And it's the most, I mean, it's, it's I personally love it. That's, uh, I did it for 15 years at the national level, but, and I still love it here today. It, it's a challenge. But what I'm, the biggest lessons learned that I can say is um, start thinking of it now, because one day it is going to impact wherever you sit. Another thing we learned is NIMBY, not in my backyard. Um, when these disasters occur, sometimes you have to build communities. They're called group sites or commercial pads. Um, but, when you, but when you build the group sites, you bring in all this infrastructure, you bring all the units in, and then you have to go to the cities and say, hey, I want to use it in this um, vacant lot. Well, you go to the city council and they're like, mm, that's not happening here. I don't want those people uh, staying there. I don't know what that means. Uh, I love when people say it around me. I am one of those people. Uh, I did lose my home in Katrina, so did my family. Uh, I think I'm a pretty good person, so I don't know what that means, but I can tell you what it means to me is during Katrina, you had all those news clips way, happening way over here of, you know, um, whether it, they were doing drugs or meth labs or whatever they were doing in, in, in their units, and that's the perception that's out there right now. But we have to clean that perception up. So one of the biggest lessons learned, not only for this disaster, but just nationally, is as you speak in uh, to to uh, your county and your city and whoever that is, let's just make sure that you know those people are the people that lost their houses. Uh, we have very few crime in the group sites that are being managed right now. Um, I think the number is definitely less than one percent. Probably no different than it would have been if that was a community uh, standing before the incident. Um, disaster case management. I'm actually going to let Sherry get into this. Um, I, it didn't. It just, it's slow. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a needed um, uh, action, but I can say um, it, it doesn't really work as well as it should. Uh, we're dealing, I'm, I'm not stuttering, I'm just trying to be, um, anyway, Sherry, you can get tomorrow into disaster case management. <laughs> um, the quirky thing with disaster case management is they use this formula from the Fed side, and they think um, these are the numbers, like it's 10, it's, it's, I think it's 35 to one. But the problem, so it's one case management per 35 feet, but the problem though is that there's, there's a bunch of numbers out there. We're dealing with something right now, the number of people that have not been serviced, served uh, or case managed is from 826 to 8,000. And no one can agree to the number, but the only one that, 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 that FEMA is gonna allow us to go with is of course, the one that's less than 900. Um, so that's one thing Sharon and I are working right now. And it is pivotal that it is, it's, it's, a, it's such a, a great um, thing. It's, it addresses the unmet needs, but you know, it's, it seems like every incident we could always improve disaster case management. 
Uh, elected officials is another lessons learned, um, particularly for everyone in this room and, and, and myself, is we have to quickly make sure that we're communicating with them. We have to quickly ensure that when they're calling, whether it's the governor's office or the East Coast uh, uh, or, or having press conferences, that we give them all the information that they need. Um, when I, when I got here, I said it's imperative that everything I know and my team knows, the county and city needs to know, and the elected officials need to know. We should be saying the same number. We should be saying the same thing. It should be no uh, surprises. Uh, I think it's working well uh, since I got here uh, with the campfire. There's still, every week, I just scratch my head and go, <laughs> why is Sherry or the town calling me? And typically, it's a comms issue. We will get there, but it's, it's, I can tell you from where I stand, it's one of the most important things that we could do as emergency managers is over-communicate. Um, including for individual assistance, uh, you know, communication is key with the individual and in how we communicate to them. Uh, I'm still um, trying to make FEMA realize that we can communicate collectively better to the individual. What I, what I mean by that is, and I don't know if y'all know this, but when somebody loses their home, and there's a IA's turned on, uh, and then the call center from FEMA turns on, and it's called a pre-placement interview. That name alone irks me. But um, the very first question is not how are you, uh, uh, do you need any counseling? It's did you lose your home? And the next question is what is your permanent housing plan and will you relocate? To me, that is, uh, uh, <laughs> I just think it's a wrong way to approach those, those, uh, those uh, calls. Uh, it's one thing I'm doing here. Um, uh, we're, we had 5,000 or so cases uh, that we're trying to get information back from FEMA because they recalled out, and we're going to call them personally. We're going to case management uh, through the long-term recovery team uh, and just see um, is there truly any unmet uh, needs. Group sites, if, any, if anybody is in here is involved in group sites, my only advice, as long as I'm here, I'm going to be pushing you to do it, and I'll be definitely pushing FEMA to do it, is to make sure that we look through the lens of it's not short term. 18 months is not short term. Um, Eric says I was here for six months. You know, that's, you know, I feel like I've been here for six years, but um, I, I can say, what I mean by that is, you know, when you lose everything and, you, and you're with everyone that has lost everything, I think it's imperative, I think it's nice, and I think it's the human thing to do to have a community center. Whether that's a picnic table, a tent, somewhere where people can just walk around and just say, hey, I need a hug. Oh, let's talk about something other than the disaster. Because right now on these group sites, all they can do is just go home in their trailer, which has no grass, no playground for kids, no dog walks, nothing but dirt in their trailer. And if you could tell I'm displeased, I am. It's a FEMA program, not a state program. But I can tell you, moving forward, it's just something that we have to demand uh, from the federal government. It's, and they're going to say, we don't want to make it too comfortable. Well, I don't know what that means. But I know every hotel you go to has a picnic table almost these days. They even have a place to smoke at most hotel uh, places. They have a place where you can meet. Uh, they have a place where a dog can use the bathroom called grass. Uh, these are simple things, I think, that we can demand. Um, because at the end of the day, it is our people, right? This is our program. Um, it's our state. Um, I think the county, city, I think the biggest thing is, um, is, just, to be, is just to be united uh, with, with us. Uh, I'd probably speak to Sherry four or five times a week, late at night, and I think it's the only thing that keeps me sane uh, to make sure that I'm giving, providing her everything that she needs. I do it the same for the town. I've been on the phone with uh, Sonoma. I don't, I don't think Sonoma's here. With the Kincaid fire uh, quite a bit, but it's, uh, it's, it's one, one lessons learned is you go to some of these disasters um, and, and there's, it seems like a battle. It just can't be, right? It, we just have to be united uh, on that. Um, hazard mitigation, I know it was mentioned earlier. Um, I think the biggest lessons learned from 17 and 18 and even when I'm, and I'm I just reviewed like $35 million worth of projects and we sent them off and um, it's clear that when you get this pot of money, everybody's starting to become innovative and they're like, yes, we're going to do this. 
I encourage all of you all to, what would y'all want to do now if you had that money? Already have that plan in place. Be innovative. Be, 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 you know, tie everything together. More importantly, identify the cost share. The biggest issue with hazard mitigation is the cost share. So many people say, I'm going to use DR money for the cost share. Well, A, that's assuming you're getting CDBG DR. Uh, and B, that's really not a good cost share because you would never get that within the 12 month time frame anyway, because it takes at least two years for those federal dollars uh, to, uh, to uh, come in. Another, finally, my last lessons learned, I know I'm speaking long, Eric, but I had a little extra time, but um, I think the biggest lesson learned for me as a federal, uh, a, a former federal uh, employee, now state employee, and a former or current survivor, or whatever the word is today, um, is uh, don't depend on the federal government, and I know it's, you already all know that, but don't think that when IA's turned on, your individual assistance and housing programs are no longer needed at the county and city level um, uh, because they won't be. The programs are very small. The programs are, uh, while the Stafford Act is written in a way to be innovative and help, the policies that go in place underneath those are everything but that. Uh, example at NEMA, they're going, they, they want the states to now take over their, their uh, the, uh, housing uh, mission. Of course they do. And, and I told them in a comment, I was like, the state of California would love to take this on. As long as I don't have to go through your procurement rules, uh, as long as I don't have to go by your policies, let me just go by what's in the regulations in the Stafford Act. And they said, well, we'll talk with you. Well, I, I saw the draft just this weekend, and it's basically everything they currently do. And on top of that, we have to do all these other things as a state, like have a housing plan, which I don't mind, but they want us to identify a group site in every county. And they want to do it in a month. Yeah, let me, Bennett, let me go to LA and uh, see how that works for me, right? So um, it's not. So it's ridiculous. Uh, I'll be taking this head on. It's supposed to come out in the spring, and I'm going to be very vocal. Uh, because if we have to do this, the only thing that it's going to do for us is it's going to ensure that we can't house people quick. Um, and at the end of the day, the program is supposed to be about housing. Um, so that's my rant uh, on that. Um, on the rebuild, I think one thing the lessons learned is codes and insurance codes at the local codes, you know, as you rebuild. One thing, Coffee Park rebuilt extremely well. And one thing they did was they quickly realized they have to uh, change the way they, they built. So they allowed smaller homes on parcels and whatnot. And they did that fairly quick. And I think they're up to 70% rebuilt already, um, which is huge in two uh, years. And they did lose uh, quite a bit. And make sure you constantly speak with insurance. One thing I'm pushing for in the hazard mitigation side is, um, and, I'm a be and I'm speaking to the commissioner of uh, insurance, is you know, how do we build um, how do we build back with metrics in mind that, hey, we have this um, uh, defensible space, whether it's around the county, around the city, or X, many, or X amount of homes are built above and beyond what that code is? How can that drive, well, A, can that ensure insurance is even allowed? Uh, and B, can that actually drop down insurance? And that's one thing I'm pushing for, because if you can just imagine you have a county that has defensible space all around the county, which is beautiful green and, you know, whatever, uh, but it's a break, right? Especially if it's 100 yards. And you have homes, 75% are built above and beyond the WUI code. I think as assurance commissioner, not that I am, but we should be like, hey, well, they should get a discount, right? Whoever builds back there should be awarded something. That should be the incentive to go back. Um, now, that, what I just said has a lot of issues with it, but this is just one thing I'm trying to push because you can't rebuild back as quick as you want if the insurance is not gonna be insuring the homes that are getting built back. And by the way, if you disagree with anything I'm saying, just raise your hand and I'll be glad to talk. Path forward for me uh, on public assistance front, um, which is by far the, it's where the dollars are. One thing I've seen is we don't use mitigation at all. Uh, when I got here, the, the uh, project worksheets for PA were at 2% mitigation. Um, that's just free money on the table. You know, you have category C to G projects and you can get 15% of that, you know. It could be a simple thing of a abatement, you, you have to hit, a, hit a, a flood, you hit a runoff and you have to reseed it. Well, maybe you could put hydro seed and do other things and you can get that $1,500 to a $10,000 project. 
Um, I told my team that I want 25% of all projects to have mitigation identified by January 1. Uh, I don't know if we'll get there uh, by January 1, 2020, um, but I know we're already up to 15%. So uh, I'm speaking, let you all know that because it'll be your applicants that we're pushing this to. And now I'm requiring every, starting today, every PA project worksheet or every applicant briefing that we do, a recovery scope meeting is on a category to CNG project. I want a note to say, a, a notification of what they're doing with 406. And if they say n they're doing nothing with 406, I'm requiring them to give me a memo to file to me. Uh, and uh, I'll be looking at those uh, personally. Because I don't, my goal in my, in my role is two things. One, on the breeze to make sure that we're doing everything on the procurement side so where the state's not losing money. And two, my other goal is to make sure that I'm spending every federal dollar to the penny uh, and putting it back to this state. Um, so that's why I was uh, hired. Uh, also, I wanted to look at PA and really just recovery in general is how do we rebuild using 404 and 406? How do we bring 404 together? How do we ensure that as a state, we're looking this at a holistically approach and working with county, neighboring counties and tying those, four, those uh, 404 mitigation projects dollars together? Because I could, I could say if there's a united project that comes across my desk and it's helping a lot of uh, people in the state, whether it's county led or it's tie into something else, like a tie into the water, whatever it is, maybe uh, those are uh, uh, those are very interesting projects, um, and they become very competitive because hazard mitigation is very competitive. And so I'm just giving you some tips of how to be very competitive. Um, I'm going to definitely be asking the team to own the process more and public assistance. What that means is, is I don't know if, who has been through a PA. Incident. I'm assuming most people here. So there's these things called program delivery managers. That's not a thing, it's a person. Uh, <laughs> um, but they come in and they talk to her, and then they talk to, they have, I don't know what the metric is anymore, seven to 10 applicants, and that's, that's their vision, and that's all they do. Um, but I can tell you the problem is, you know, FEMA doesn't have enough. They're trying to hire a thousand of them. So when I meet some of the PDMGs, even since I've been here, you know, they've never done this before. And you know that is the that is the customer service arm of how things are being rebuilt. So moving forward, any event that we have, hopefully not this year. It doesn't start to next year. We have a wind event, unfortunately, Wednesday again. But um, is any large project, uh, which is I think 127,000 now, uh, I'm going to have a state PDMG over that. I'm going to own recovery. We're going to own recovery. Uh, this, these are our applicants, it's not FEMA's applicants, and uh, I'm going to start with the large projects. It's critical for us uh, to move forward doing that. One thing y'all can do to help me is there's this thing called the grants portal. Uh, that's one thing Grady, Grady mentioned that we redesigned the PA program. We did, so if you don't like it, it was more Grady than me. Uh, but in all seriousness, what we did do is create the grants portal, which does, it does do... Um, one thing very well, it tracks everything. So to me, I don't like appeals. I hate appeals. We should not like appeals. We should get to yes, day one. Appeals take time, it takes money, and more importantly, it's not getting money into the street where it, where it needs to be. So the more that we can track things electronically, and you can see exactly what everything is or what is missed, and everybody talks EEIs, EEIs, uh, well, it's there, so you know exactly where that is. But what we're not doing right now, what the system can do, and nobody wants to do it, but I'm encouraging all of you to do it. And Bennett, if you can own this in LA, it would be huge for us, uh, is let's get in there now before the incident and put our, put, put our hospitals and everything in there now. Identify, load in the insurance records, load in the maintenance records, take a picture of the hospital the first month of the year so where when the incident happens, you have pictures of that. Because if you do all that now, when an incident happens, we can flip money around in days, not, not months. Uh, so I encourage all of y'all to take advantage of that. And it's a free system, um, as of today anyway. Uh, individual assistance, um, I'm, I'm much, um, so we don't have an IA program, right, at Cal US. We have CDAA, but we don't have IA. Um, I take offense to that because I think we have a lot of things in IA. I consider this an IA. This is my vision for Cal OES. There's a circle and there's a person in it. And anything that touches that person is IA. 
So our team is going to be refocused in the next few months to be the expert on SBA, to be the expert on working with CDH with uh, with, with uh, CDSS to understand all those programs. They're going to be an expert on um, uh, uh, you know nonprofits. How do we get into that person? So yes, we don't have an IA program, but we have a lot of people in California, 40 million people. So we have a lot of individuals, and I have an individual assistance team, and they're going to be the experts on on how to help you help that person. Um, on the planning side, I personally would never be a planner. I would not do well. Um, I particularly don't like to read plans, even though I do. Uh, as I said, I have been reading the debris management plans. San Francisco was 400 plus pages. Um, but what I can say is that I do want to make sure that we're planning for a real world uh, events. So what I mean by that is I want the debris management plan that the state's drafting, that we do have people, I think I have somebody in LA, you know, it's the county city been helping me in San Francisco and, and, and some others, but I want the plan to be first off all hazards. You know, we've, I think we've covered fire. I think we, we, we know where we are with fire. But the most common, you know, disaster here is floods. We do have mudslides. I'm from Louisiana. We probably will have a hurricane down south now that I'm here. I think the last one was in the 60s, Eric, at San Diego. Um, yeah, it'll be a small one, but uh, um, but I want, and I, but I also want the plan not only be all hazards. I want it to be real world. Um, you know, we talk about being resilient. Um, you know, I have the ABCs of what that means, but the C of that is you know capacity. But even capacity, if you read these plans, is it really meeting what you what what the reality is of tomorrow. A lot of the plans that I've been seeing, it's still based off of the threats that were around in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Well, times have changed. Uh, so we have to be looking at those plans as we draft these plans, including housing plans. I'm gonna have a housing plan for the state. I want all of y'all to take a look at it for us. And I, I, more, more so, I want y'all to leverage what we're doing. Uh, start with us. My debris management plan, I have 12 guides to lead me there I'm using uh, the counties to help us because it should be united, right? It should be the same in state of, of all of this, but it has to be realistic. The housing plan, when you say, you know, oh, you're gonna, I was reading one, it was a chart up when I first got here, and they said everybody's gonna be after disaster, everybody's gonna be housed into temporary shelters in 30 days. That's false, it's not gonna happen. So be realistic as, you, as you're uh, setting these uh, plans up, and that's my C for being resilient. I won't bore you with the A or B. Um, one other thing we're doing moving forward is, you know, Alex talked about the IDE teams and the PDA teams, is one thing what we don't have here is we don't have teams identified. When a disaster happens, it's basically uh, an email goes out and three people are sent somewhere, and um, I think there's a better way of supporting you all. Uh, so we can have monthly teams identified, um, and I want you all to know who those monthly teams are. I want my teams to come out to you all, and they, when, they, when they arrive in your county or city, uh, a, that's probably not a good thing, but uh, B, I want you to be comfortable with that. Um, and that's important for me to get out in front of that. Also, Recovery Task Force is something we just started. We did it in Ridgecrest. Uh, we did it in this recent fires. Uh, my team's in Kincaid right now. Um, recovery Task Force is I actually leveraged the recovery support functions uh, because they have expertise, not just in infrastructure, uh, or housing, but also economics. And they know where to find those, those programs that can help identify your gaps. Their job when they get there, and Leia has been to, I think, every one of them, um, um, is, can you raise your hand, Leia? So, <laughs> um, she's been, every one is, is to embed in the county or city, help identify where your gaps are, and then come up with a plan when she comes back home, working with the teams and giving you a concrete uh, document that you all can use uh, moving forward. And she doesn't go away. Uh, Ridgecrest, she just finished, I believe, saying that all their needs were met. Uh, so that's something that we're getting out in front of that. And unfortunately, with this new IA program, with uh, declaration criteria, I think moving forward, we can have more of this, these types of events uh, than the federal types of events. So it's important that we get out in front of, of, um, of uh, that. Um, I think that's all I had. I'm gonna have, nope, so debris. Two other things. Uh, 
So Eric mentioned, you know, uh, everybody, we're just not going to come in and clean up. So Sonoma Kincaid had uh, 200 homes, I think. Um, but, you know, it, it didn't rise to the level of their capacity for us to come in. But one thing we're doing is, uh, it doesn't mean we don't assist at the state level. So we brought, I brought uh, my debris uh, manager. He got embedded with the county. He gave him the technical assistance. We brought in um, uh, Cal Recycle to give them technical assistance, particularly on the contracting side of things. Legal actually reviewed not only the statement of work, but also the contract to ensure compliance, because at the end of the day, this may be eligible for CDA. So we want to make sure that we're assisting you all, if this was you all in that incident, to make sure that there was a reimbursement um, capacity. We also uh, brought in uh, DTSC. Uh, they actually gave them the contracts that were pre-negotiated with Cal Recycle DTSC. So we knew going in, if the county selected one of these contracts, they would be eligible for that. Um, they, the Russian uh, River um, is, um, close to there, and we're making sure, using CAL FIRE and some others, um, to make sure that there is no major debris flow that would impact the Russian River. That was ongoing last week, and that report should be done this week. Um, but that's a lot of help. Um, so it's a monumental effort on our part, but uh, just because it, it, it doesn't rise to the level of a state-led or a fed-led, it doesn't mean that we're gonna be out in front of this. Uh, our director here at the state, uh, is very forward-leaning, very forward-thinking, and um, uh, I treat recovery like response. Re recovery does not start 30 days. Every, you know, when somebody asks me, so what is that transition? I just cringe at that. Uh, uh, it should be, well, it should be minus 180. We should be already thinking about all of this stuff, as I mentioned already, uh, but more importantly, you know, uh, when Two weeks ago, uh, Grady, the assistant director, I was at NEMA and we had this, you know, the power shut off and the fires. He was sitting with Eric Lamero. He was sitting in the, in the UCG room, uh, day one, uh, hour one. And that's how I treat recovery. Recovery and response are united. Recovery cannot work well if we're not united with response. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kune to go over the recovery support function. She has eight slides. You know, if there's anything you'd like to ask after she's done, I'd be more than glad to answer them. So good morning, I'm Pune Simpson, as he said, uh, overseeing the long-term recovery interagency um, coordination group at OES. We're a relatively new unit, so I have some slides to share with you. I think you've seen this timeline before. Um, it's a FEMA timeline. We use it in a lot of our presentations. What's different about it now is with Ryan's leadership, we've really moved the timeline for recovery to pre-disaster, right? We're going to start before a disaster stop, starts meeting with you, planning with you, uh, the different contingencies and plans. When the event happens, we're going to be in the State Operations Center along with our response partners, gathering information and, and creating that preliminary plan of recovery with you. And then we will stay with you through the three different stages after the event happens, all the way until you're um, uh, self-sustained and, and recovering. So um, with that, we have the four different divisions um, in recovery that uh, Ryan touched on, individual assistance, public assistance, and mitigation are programs that you're familiar with. They're Stafford Act programs. So we're the new unit, we're the new division, and um, there are six components to us, six sectors or recovery support functions, as we call them. Housing, economic, community planning, natural resources, infrastructure, and health and social services. And they're in each a team in the joint field office right now working with our federal partners and working with the local jurisdiction on the different projects that have um, been identified. So the six RSFs are very much like the ESFs and they partner with the ESFs. You can see the interrelationship uh, between the RSFs and the ESFs. We, um, again, started the onset of the disaster working with our ESF partners to not duplicate, not hit our local jurisdictions multiple times asking for the same thing, but really collaborate with them to support the, the locals. <clears throat> so what is long-term recovery? Long-term recovery begins and ends uh, with the locals. We believe that here at OES, our job is to support the locals um, and work with our federal partners, our nonprofit um, agencies to identify resources for the locals as they prioritize their projects. So 
goal of long-term recovery is moving towards self-sufficiency. We want the locals, the counties, the cities, the towns to be self-sufficient, to be able to help themselves in that recovery process and help them um, become more resilient. So the key person for us in terms of um, our partners is the local disaster recovery manager. And um, hopefully each jurisdiction will identify who that person is and um, help that person engage with us before an event so that we have that partnership, that relationship, that dialogue started before an event starts. Um, their job really is to represent and speak on behalf of the local jurisdiction in terms of priorities. At the state level, we have um, state agencies assigned to each of the recovery support functions. Health and Social Services, it's Health um, and Human Services Agency. We've got our partners from the Department of Public Health sitting in the back. They lead that RSF in terms of setting the priorities of how we help the local jurisdictions with housing, it's business, consumer services and housing agency, infrastructure is OES, we're taking the lead on that one. Um, natural and Cultural Resources is the Natural Resources Agency. Community Planning Capacity Building, the Governor's Office of um, Planning and Research. And we've got some advisors, um, the FEMA partners or advisors in individual assistance, disability integration, mitigation, EPA, and a rural development are in the joint field office with us or accessible to us in the joint field office, advising us on different projects and uh, funding sources that we might want to tap into. In terms of activation, when we are activated, our goal is to support the needs um, of the locals in terms of human, technical, and uh, financial resources. So um, there's four divisions in recovery. The other three come with many, ours doesn't. So um, our goal is to find resources, um, aside from the standard Stafford Act programs, such as donations, in-kind services, um, federal programs that we may, may not typically uh, know exist or tap into, um, even some local, I'm mean, sorry, some state programs that are just steady state um, uh, programs the state has that you may not be aware of that could be helpful to you in uh, your recovery process. Um, Identifying the challenges and collaborating. You know, in the recovery process, there's lots of layers, right? Layers of funding, layers of coordination, layers of planning. And um, our job is to help you through that in terms of project planning and creating timelines, creating um, a path forward in terms of your recovery. Um, in terms of our approach, we have a whole community approach. We believe that every member of your community needs to be part of the recovery process in order for it to be successful. We've reached this conclusion from having recovery programs and processes that didn't include everybody, and I've learned that that doesn't sit well with the, um, with the community. So the people, the people that live there, um, having a say, the faith-based organizations, the private sector, nonprofits, government agencies, elected officials, um, really looking at the entire community and asking them, what do you want to look like? What, what do you see your community looking like after we recover? Not what does the state or the federal government want you to look like? So um, whole community approach is very important to us. So here's a, a, a sample, the crosswalk for Paradise's projects, because we are talking, uh, we're working uh, every day on the campfire. And um, we've talked a lot about Campfire today. So um, in terms of the six RCEFs, the kinds of projects that were identified, the gaps, the needs for Paradise, and then how we're prioritizing them and uh, helping them find solutions. Just a snapshot of point in time of what we're doing for Paradise. So what does the um, end look like, right? What is the outcome we're looking for? Well, for housing, we're looking for um, a situation where the displaced survivors have um, accessible, safe, permanent housing. In infrastructure, we're looking at a system that's restored and resilient to future disasters. In health and social services, we want to sustain health, um, disability, and social service programs, including behavioral health, schools, um, programs for children. Along those lines with health and social services, we're doing something for the first time in partnership with Mary. Um, to stand up a children and youth task force focused on all the aspects of what a child may need in a disaster because they are the, one of the most vulnerable populations and the impact of a disaster lasts with them their entire life, right? So what can we do um, collectively to remove barriers, to not work in silos? What do those children need? Well, one of the things we've identified already is their parents need help. 
their parents don't know how to support them. So those kinds of wraparound services to educate not just the teachers and the counselors in the schools, but also the parents, the entire community that needs to wrap around those children and make sure that they're recovering. With economic, we're looking at bringing back work. Um, we're bring, looking to bring back the businesses. And that's a really complex one, you know. Uh, housing is complex, but economic is too. California has a shortage of a workforce in certain sectors. So getting the right workforce to move back when there's a housing shortage is very hard. So these, each of these RCEPs are so interrelated and it's so complex trying to talk a business into coming back when they can't hire anybody and there's really no one living in the community that would sustain them is very hard. So um, bringing the, uh, the, the business back really is the future um, of a community. And then the natural and cultural resor resources the historical um, essence of that community. Uh, and I always ask, what is the difference in your mind when you think of San Diego versus Sa San Francisco versus Sacramento versus um, maybe uh, Butte County, right? Very different images come to mind because that's the natural and cultural resources of that community in that county that make it so unique. We have very unique counties. And so the cultural, natural and cultural resources, RSF's goal is to identify what is unique in that community that needs to be restored, that needs to recover for them to have their identity back again. And then community planning capacity building is really at the core of all of these RCEPs, wrapping them all into a, a recovery plan, uh, a path forward um, for that community. So uh, I think that's it for me. Hey, before I get to any questions, just three things. Uh, one, on the individual side, uh, I think when you go through a disaster and you're talking to people, um, uh, I can tell you this is what they hear. <laughs> so when you go there, you know, we call them, hey, so these are all the great programs. Have you spoke to FEMA? Have you went to the county? How is church going? They're writing all that down, and they're going to put it in their pocket. And they go, you know what? I just lost my house. I might have just lost my dog, my, my friend, my relative. When I get a chance to deal with that, I'm going to pull that sheet out of my back pocket. So keep that in mind as you're dealing with survivors. I can tell you that may not happen for a year. <laughs> uh, when I left St. Bernard Parish, uh, which was totally destroyed, uh, and drove, I never cried, ever. Big tough guy, right? So, uh, but when I, when I left that parish and I left, it was, I was with my dad and I was getting this great job at FEMA and uh, we went to the Louisiana Mississippi border and I cried when I left this, the, the, uh, the uh, state. And I don't know why I cried other than I knew this. I was never going back, right? So uh, that's tough, right? I was so busy because as soon as disaster happened, I was helping everyone doing all these things. I never even had time to, to, to cope with anything. But that was a year later, and I was crying. And my dad luckily didn't say anything for like 15 minutes. So I thought he was going to make a joke, but he didn't. So um, those feelings are raw. Uh, they're real. And it also goes to the community level as well. Uh, we will come in after an event and we bring in all these state agencies, even before the federal agencies, we're sitting with the counties and we're talking and then there's meeting after meeting. And it literally, it looks like that slide deck, right? With the big store in the middle of lines. Uh, I think sometimes it's good to go slow to go instead of fast. And ensuring that everything that we bring in to you all is coordinated. We have to make sure at the state level that we're controlling those incidences where if there is a HCD meeting for housing, maybe we can tie that into a FEMA meeting with housing at the same time or the RSF, our state partner meeting at the same time. And maybe it needs to be a week later than when everybody wants to meet, right? Because at the end of the day, it's your disaster, right? So, and we're here to support you and to take passion of that. And with closing before, before comments, I am from St. Bernard Parish. Uh, was a beautiful parish, loved it. Twenty-six thousand homes, I believe, uh, on the on the parish side. And obviously, you know, it, it got destroyed. Some people had, I think, the lowest amount of water was five feet. Most people had twenty plus feet of water. Uh, you know, and you know, going through that, <clears throat> whoever had a house left would would hurry up and go home, and they would uh, get all of their belongings. Now, granted, most of the ceilings fell in, right, because it was the water line was above that. And, Everything fell in. So you were getting all your plates and your, and your wedding gifts 
and you would dry them out, and two days later they were full of mold, because it's porous. It's been sitting there for like two or three weeks. All trash, garbage, what a complete waste of time. So we were like, we wish we didn't have a house to go to, right? The people that didn't have a house to go to was like, I really wished we had a house to, to go to. At the end of the day, everybody lost everything. And what was worse about that particular incident, I know I'm recorded live, but is, you know, the rebuild process was extraordinarily slow. It took over a decade to get a hospital in place. We had 16, 17 schools. They have one right now, one of, of, of its elementary, middle. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, and I could say this as a resident of the parish, was the parish had a vision. And the vision was the day before the incident. It wasn't the future. It wasn't what just happened. So when something happens like this, I always say, take the blinders off. You know, be the community that has 5G. Be the community that has, you know, a great art museum or something to where when people wants to come back to, it's built to, not modern day, but it's built to yesterday, to uh, Tomorrowland, uh, or Futureland, I think, is Disney World, right? So, um, and not be tied to the incident. Because every community that's only thinking about building to what it was, it's a long recovery. So, any, any questions for me? Any questions? All right, thank you, Ryan. We're gonna take about five minutes and then have Reva Feldman, the city manager for the city of Malibu, come up and address us for a moment. Great, thanks. I was just reminded by the, uh, the, the league that there actually is a resource we talked very briefly about uh, whether a resource exists that we've compiled for locals to, to use in the event of a disaster, specifically in the context of ordinances, debris ordinances. And um, shortly after the, the summit that Eric referenced, in early June, there was a, an attorney-only summit that the League and the uh, Association of County Councils put together. And from that, there was a playbook that uh, contains pretty much anything you would need uh, in, in response to a disaster, whether it's ordinances or relevant laws or templates of contracts. So that resource does exist. It's on the, the League's website right now. Uh, and um, any questions afterwards, feel free to come to Derek or me, but I wanted to make sure you all knew that uh, that is out there for you all to use. Thanks. Before I have Reva come up, I just want to uh, express how appreciative I am of both her time as well as Sherry with Butte County uh, with the responsibilities for running a city and running a county and taking the time out of their schedules to be with us today. It means a lot to, to listen and, and learn from you, so thank you. Good morning, I'm Reva Feldman. I'm the city manager from the city of Malibu and I'm glad to be here with all of you today. Um, it's always very humbling to come to OES and to hear stories of other communities um, and what they've gone through. And um, my disaster, as horrible as it has been for our community, does pale in comparison to some of the things um, our other friends throughout the state have gone through. Um, so I'm gonna give a short presentation on what uh, we went through in Los Angeles last year.
Um, so I'm very fortunate to have an incredible staff and that video was made by my media team. Um, so I'm really appreciative of, of what they do for us. Um, this map is the fire area of the Woolsey Fire. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Los Angeles, the Woolsey Fire started north of the 101. It actually started in Ventura County. And from where the green triangle is at the top of this map to uh, the coastline is roughly 25 miles, give or take, depending on which part of the coastline you're getting to. And the Woolsey Fire burnt that distance in less than 24 hours. Um, it uh, got through to the 101 freeway about uh, eight hours or so, uh, eight to 10 hours after it started. Um, the 101 freeway at that point is roughly 200 feet, 200 feet wide. And so our firefighters really thought that they would be able to contain that fire and stop it. And we had um, you know, 50 to 70 mile hour winds at that point, and it was picking up embers and throwing them two miles ahead of the fire front. And that was where um, they lost the fire. Um, but I want to dial back a little as I tell the story. I like to give kind of the week that we were in at, when the Woolsey fire started. On Monday, um, the, we share a captain um, with our station, with our neighboring cities. We're contract city with Los Angeles County Sheriff Department. My sheriff captain had a stroke on Monday, and it was the first day of our new operations lieutenant, so I had never met her. Um, so she took the helm when he went to the hospital. On Tuesday, we had an election. I had two city council members that were termed out. I had two new council members elected. We had a new governor and we also had a sheriff race in Los Angeles County, um, and it took about 10 days for that sheriff race to be determined. So as of Tuesday, we didn't know who the sheriff was. Um, we were also under a PSPS watch. Um, it was one of the earlier ones, uh, obviously a year ago, and um, we in Malibu were very prepared for it. We've been messaging with our community. We were under a red flag watch. We had our EOC open and ready to staff it. My staff was on high alert um, and, and, and we were expecting it. Um, and then on Wednesday evening, we had the borderline grill shooting in Thousand Oaks, um, which is a neighboring community for us. Um, there were a lot of Pepperdine University students there. Pepperdine is located uh, just outside of the city of Malibu, but it's uh, our school is what we consider it. Um, and we had a student who lost her life there. We had 16 other students who were at um, the borderline grill during the shooting. I had staff members who had friends and family who were there and who were impacted. So we started Thursday morning um, dealing with that disaster. Um, I personally was at uh, Pepperdine um, um, with them, with their students. And um, then the campfire broke out and then the hill fire, and you can see that on this map that, uh, where that broke out. And we were really concerned about the hill fire. It started in an area that had burnt the year prior that burnt all the way to the coast. Um, and so resources were sent to the hill fire and to the campfire, and then the Woolsey fire broke out. And so we were the last in the state to get resources. And that's a common story that we're now hearing with after action reports that um, there just weren't enough resources and our folks were calling and calling through mutual aid for hundreds and hundreds of engines and just not getting them. So um, that was one of the things you'll hear as I go through that was really a challenge. In Malibu, uh, we're ready. We, we burn, we have mudslides, we flood. These are normal things for us, um, unfortunately, and we're very uh, well versed in emergency preparedness, particularly for a small city. The city of Malibu actually has 13,000 residents. Uh, we're a long city, we're 21 miles long, and we have a very high visitor population of about 15 million people a year. Um, but we talk about emergency preparedness. In the year prior to the Woolsey fire, we had um, done multiple trainings at our emergency operations center. We had trained with our partner agencies. I had done a test throughout the city of our reverse 911 system. Um, and, and we really would have said, if you had asked me the day before the fire, if there's a major fire, are you ready? Have you thought of everything? And we really had. We had thought of alternate locations in the city for our EOC, um, if our city hall building where our EOC is located was impacted. Um, I had staff trained which way and that way, um, who could do different roles. Um, you know, I had lists of where staff were located. And again, as a small city, I have a small staff, I have 100 people. And so um, I thought we were ready, and then the Woolsey fire hit. 
Um, so uh, when the fire started and started to impact uh, Malibu, it was the middle of the night. Um, my personal story was I was also impacted and I evacuated. So as I was evacuating my home, I'm on the phone waking my staff up, getting them to the uh, EOC at City Hall to activate and start our messaging. Uh, we have a protocol that when a fire hits or is in the 101 corridor area, we uh, activate our EOC, and then if it starts uh, jumping the 101 and it's traveling, we start preparing to evacuate our residents. Um, so they evacuated 250,000 people in the uh, Woolsey Fire area um, in a very short amount of time. The entire 101 freeway shut down, which left just canyon roads that feed onto Pacific Coast Highway, which is a state-owned highway, uh, two lanes each way in and out of Malibu. And when the evacuation notices came for Malibu, there was a fire front of 14 miles long heading towards our entire city. So they ha again, we got direction from the fire department to evacuate the entire city. And because of the hill fire, which was burning to the north and west of us, and the concern from the fire department that that fire would hit the highway, they had us direct all of our residents uh, south or east on Pacific Coast Highway towards Santa Monica. And so the image that you see is uh, traffic um, on the highway. What was would normally take people about 20 minutes took people six hours to get out. Um, we are in the EOC and we're sending out our messaging. And again, we have a very robust uh, notification system. We <coughs> use something called e-notification through our website, which um, allows residents to sign up for emergency alerts. And so we can send that out and get a text or an email. We used our reverse 911 system. Um, we use Nixle. Um, so we were pushing out information in all these different ways. But what we didn't know while we were sitting in the EOC, that power had gone out through the entire Woolsey area and through the entire city. So that meant that residents who were at their home, and it's now light out, uh, weren't getting evacuation notices. And so now we rolled to what was our next plan in the EOC if this happened, was that we would use law enforcement and fire resources to go through our neighborhoods and evacuate people. And uh, that didn't happen because of the number of people that were being evacuated. And the way the fire was traveling is it blocked the access through uh, the canyons into Malibu, which meant that uh, first responders, law enforcement and fire actually had to go all the way around to actually physically get into Malibu and they just weren't able to get there. So a lot of our residents did not get the evacuation notice and this is a, a big lesson learned for us um, that if you don't have Wi-Fi and you don't have cellular phones um, and you can't call people because nobody has old fashioned landlines anymore, what do you do, how do you communicate with them? Um, and then the challenges of evacuating um, thousands and thousands of people through one very uh, small area and it took hours for us to coordinate with our partner agencies with CHP Caltrans with Santa Monica with the city of Los Angeles to actually stop um, traffic coming into Malibu and take over all the lanes of the highway um, so these are things that we're working on uh, now in the aftermath to correct and have better solutions for that um, and then of course the fact that we were the third disaster in our state um, and just couldn't get the resources there fast enough. And so as a small city, what we look at now is what can we do, what can we take on as a city to make up some of those gaps? Obviously, we're not gonna fight the fire, but some of these roles that we've looked to law enforcement or fire to do, what can we actually take on? Um, I put this picture in because it's just uh, one of my favorite photos from the fire. Um, Malibu is actually a rural residential community. We have a lot of um, horse, uh, com uh, horse properties, and so evacuating large animals during a disaster is a big, big problem. And again, we weren't the first city in this fire to evacuate, so there was a, the entire Woolsey area is a rural residential area, and so there was a lot of um, issues with evacuating large animals. Um, some people obviously have llamas, um, but horses, and, and fortunately we do have the beach, and so what ended up happening is a lot of those large animals in the incident were actually just brought to the beach and their owners left them there, and then the following uh, days we had to figure out how to feed them and transport them. Um, so immediately after the disaster, things that you, you don't ever think you're going to have to do is, first of all, what we found out was that we had residents who defied the mandatory evacuation area, uh, evacuation orders and stayed. 
And so the day after uh, the fire hit through Malibu and, and the forthcoming days, we realized there were hundreds of residents who had remained behind. Many of them um, fought the fire and saved their homes and saved their neighbors' homes. The video that I showed um, was all taken, actually those videos were taken by residents who were there. Um, and so it, it created a problem that we had never really thought through, is that we thought everybody would leave. And what really happened in our fire was that people stayed. And so now how do you help the people who have stayed while you're at the same time trying to get your community back open and getting the people who had left back in safely? And so it's really a balance, particularly again for a small staff. So our EOC was also evacuated of, um, with that first day and we were fortunate enough to uh, get the open arms of the city of Santa Monica who opened their EOC to us and we worked out of there for three straight weeks. Um, but it was uh, uh, really saved us because there was no way for our staff to get in and out of Malibu um, and even for people to get to Santa Monica was about a four hour trip with the road closures one way. So um, I really leaned on the relationships that I have with other cities and other city managers and got a lot of support staff. So it's something as a city that it's very important to have those relationships of people you can just call on. You don't wait for mutual aid, you just say, do you have some bodies? I need someone who can do X. And I was very fortunate in um, the cities of West Hollywood and Santa Monica and Culver City and Beverly Hills and Indian Wells, Santa Rosa all sent me people. Um, and so then getting in to assess what has uh, happened in our city and obviously the first thing people want to know is, did my house burn down? And we couldn't even get to some of these areas and because of the way our city is laid out, it's not a grid, they're not just streets that you can see easily what was a house, there's a lot of flag lots and deep lots and lots with um, you know, ex accessory uh, structures like guest houses or barns or garages and so from the street you couldn't tell what had burned if that was the house or not and so we were very hesitant in providing that information out to our community um, it's something I've really taken away as a, a, we need to do, do that better to get people that information because that human um, interaction of being able to tell people what had happened to their home or not um, is very very critical in those immediate days um, and then try to repopulate your community where you have complete infrastructure that has been destroyed in the Woolsey Fire area. They, the Southern California Edison replaced up close to 2,000 power poles. Um, so some people didn't have power for up to a month. Um, some people took months to get uh, their communications for Wi-Fi, et cetera, back up and running. Um, and so these were just really huge challenges that we had to, A, help the utilities find a way to get in and do that, and then communicate to our residents why you couldn't get back in so you couldn't go to your house. Um, and people were saying, I don't care if there's power, I just wanna go home. And then, um, as you saw in the video, uh, it started raining, and we uh, experienced the flood after fire. Um, uh, experience and we understand that's a three to five year thing that we'll have to go through um, and again you have a community that has just gotten back into their homes of course it was over the holidays um, the Woolsey fire happened at the beginning of November so some people didn't even get back into after Thanksgiving now it's raining now it's Christmas and now you're talking about having to evacuate again um, and it, it's, it's challenging um, and we really um, heard the lessons that were learned in Montecito and LA County um, decided that they would have a um, mandatory, no evacuations or mandatory evacuations. There was no voluntary evacuation discussion, discussion when it came to the floods. And so we activated our EOC three more times um, after the Woolsey fire um, as part of the flood and debris flow um, and, and had to do evac rounds of evacuation. And, um, I know I hear it's going to be windy and hot in some parts of California this week, but um, in Southern California we're expecting rain again. So um, everybody now is gearing back up for what we um, experienced last year. And um, it's, it's uh, telling to be here at OES and talk about uh, funding and relief and whatnot. Um, but one of the problems with uh, disaster relief funds is that you only get that if there's a declaration so if it's not a federal disaster or a state disaster, if it's just a lot of rain, um, you're not gonna get money for your municipality to clean up what came off the hills. Um, and so last year we spent um, 
several million dollars just cleaning up mud that will be won't be reimbursed for and now it's something we're expecting for the next uh, few years um, so I'll, I'll let you know how that all turns out um, but we learned a lot and um, it's it's a very humbling experience to go through um, and to think as government what can we do different how do we do this better how do we think ahead of what could happen and so some of the things that we've taken upon ourselves um, is we're doing um, evacuation planning and drills and we have people who are coming up with different evacuation routes and planning um, that include figuring out the data of how many residents live in a given neighborhood, what the ingress and egress is for those neighborhoods, and coming up with multiple egress routes if one of them is impacted. Um, we've come up with safe refuge areas where we can just send people to get them off the highway and uh, open up roads to get more people out and hold them in a safe refuge area until we can uh, get some time and coordination with other agencies. Um, and we're really looking at what we can do as a city to get information out to people. And so since the Wolsey fire, um, we have actually purchased through our reverse 911 system cell phone data, which we didn't have. We only had home phone data. And so that gives us the capability of contacting anybody through our reverse 911 system who has a cell phone that's registered in our zip code. Um, we also are now fully capable and trained on doing WIA, which is the wireless emergency alert system. Um, ironically, we had uh, signed up to participate in that before the Woldy fire and had a training scheduled for the week after the fire, so we weren't able to use that, but it's certainly something that we plan on using because um, not only is it important for us to communicate with our residents, but because of the high number of visitors that we have in our community, we recognize that in a disaster we may need a and while I talk about what happened to us, which was a fire, what I think is very important for everybody in California to take away is that it might be the earthquake. And that's gonna be much, much worse than any of us have experienced in the fire because in the fire, you may actually have an opportunity to evacuate people, but in the earthquake, we're not. And so as government, we need to look at how do we help thousands and thousands of people who are stuck and need help and don't have the resources and aren't resilient. So we're really having those communication, that communication with our residents of how do you become more resilient? How as a neighborhood do you help yourself? Um, we're uh, increasing the number of CERT uh, volunteers that we have in our city. Um, we had always had emergency supply bins throughout our city. We've actually restocked them with different things. I had never thought to put um, I-95 masks in our bins, but we certainly do now. Um, and making sure that those CERT uh, members who are in each neighborhood know how to get to them and how to help people. Um, and then we purchased <coughs> megaphones, which sounds um, pretty low tech, but I'm trying to think about what do we do, how do we help, and so we actually in our city hall have 50 megaphones. We purchased uh, magnets that go on vehicles and lights that can go on top of vehicles, and we've trained our staff now to do um, evacuations of our neighborhoods. Um, we did one drill, one neighborhood a few weeks ago. We're planning on doing them in every um, neighborhood. And it's literally using staff members to drive around and say, there's a disaster, you need to leave. And the, the, the megaphones have a siren and a, the uh, audio capability. So I'm um, trying to dial down to how we can be helpful if um, you know we end up being the last disaster in the city or the state at, on a given day. And so we also really trying to think differently as a city. Um, we, as I mentioned, are a contract city, so we contract for law and fire through uh, LA County. Um, and I actually um, came up with an idea to hire a fire safety liaison for our city staff, which is a pretty unusual position for a small city. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get a retired battalion chief from Ventura County, and that's him uh, there. And he um, is meeting one-on-one -on -one with residents and doing assessments of their homes, uh, giving advice on how you can harden your home, um, helping make sure that their brush clearance is in compliance, and really being that interface between the city and our residents where the county fire department isn't able to do it or uh, doesn't have the, the manpower to go resident by resident. Um, and talk to them and um, so we're really trying to make residents know what can you do you live in a high fire area what can you do to harden your home how can you have a safer home 
what landscaping is the right thing to have and uh, introduce landscape ordinances that prohibit uh, really flammable materials um, and all these uh, types of building materials that, that really can help the homes because we can't change where we live we can't change um, the fact that we're going to have more fires but hopefully we can teach people how to have safer homes and then the other thing that we're doing um, is we took on a uh, contract with a firm that does GIS mapping in real time of fire um, and so using technology that's available and what this um, uh, system can do is and this is just an example of a fire that breaks out where it's going to go it takes into account the weather and the wind at the, a given time it'll tell me how many fires are going on in the state in time so I know where I am in the resource um, uh, distribution and it, it gives us while we're not the ones making the evacuation calls and we're not the ones chasing and fighting the fire it helps me and my staff stay a few steps ahead of what we could be facing that if this fire gets to point X, then we're going to have to evacuate what neighborhoods and how much time will I have before it gets to that point and really being able to um, kind of stay one step ahead of what we need to do in terms of messaging. Um, and then we're looking at what do we do when there isn't power? And so obviously we've all been struggling uh, the last few weeks with PSPS uh, issues. Uh, we did have one shut off in Malibu uh, two weeks ago um, for about 24 hours. Um, and as we learned in the Woolsey fire, we had no power. And so we're looking at installing sirens throughout our city, the old fashioned air raid sirens. Uh, we have a, um, a funding for the design that we're, the city is funding and we've applied for grants to install those. Um, obviously that's a multi-year project, but it's something we think very beneficial to being able to alert residents um, when there's no power. We also came out, up with what we call the point of information stations and one of the issues that we heard over and over again from our residents that remained in the evacuation area <coughs> was that they didn't have a way of getting information and so again thinking forward this is an earthquake and I have my entire city uh, in in town um, and my visitors and my um, businesses and employees and people need information and so we came up with a very simple solution of sandwich boards that we have purchased and we have tents and what we'll do is put those in key locations throughout the city shopping centers churches fire stations schools um, have staff go and put uh, information up on those boards so people can physically get to somewhere and see what is going on and get up-to-date information um, and giving people timely information in a disaster and immediately after the disaster is very, very important. And our one of the lessons that I learned is that even if there's no new information, you still have to push out that nothing has changed, that people are traumatized, people are anxious, that it's not just your residents, it's all of their families and all of their friends and the entire you know, state watching something and they want to know what's going on. So our new protocol is in, in a disaster is that every 30 minutes we're actually pushing out information uh, with a timestamp whether something has changed or not um, and it's burdensome but it's very very important and, and a big lesson learned um, we've also applied for grants to get some mobile communication um, operations for our own staff um, so what we uh, went through when there were the floods is that I had staff out 24 hours a day um, dealing with mud and debris, but they were in areas where A, it was pouring rain and they had a limited um, cell communication there and they couldn't talk to anybody. So we're looking at ways to get these mobile uh, communication systems to not only help our staff, but also help residents as well. And then just coming up with different ways to message the same information. So you use reverse 911 and you use that to the home and the uh, cell phones and we have our advisory system and we have Nixle and we have social media and we have our bullhorn system and over and over in any way that you can think of to get the same information out and then just keep pushing it out um, and, and it's key especially in an evacuation um, people could die if they don't get that notice and it's something you know as a local government official I take very seriously that I want to know that people are getting that information as they need it.
Um, but the good news is we're moving on. So one year later, um, almost 50% of our burned homes, single family homes, um, have uh, come into the planning uh, department and through the planning process. So uh, we have um, 37 under construction and quite a few more, the 181 number represents um, properties that have gotten clearance for a planning department and are now developing their uh, building plans and getting clearance from the other departments. And so um, it gives us hope to know uh, that, that people are moving along, um, but it's, it's a difficult time for community, the trauma, um, and the fact that we keep catching on fire all around us. And so uh, the way the winds blow in Southern California is anytime there's a fire inland, all that smoke blows out to the ocean, um, unless there's an offshore breeze. And um, so you have a lot of people keep smelling smoke and thinking we're on fire again. Um, so it's, it's been very painful and slow and having um, staff on board who can support those residents, um, who can help people through this really difficult um, just by being there and doing what we can as government and then helping residents become more resilient themselves. And that's the end of my report. Thank you for taking the time to listen and I'm happy to take any questions. What we're going to do is we're going to hold all the questions until uh, Sherry's done. So thank you very much, Reba. Appreciate it. We're going to take just a minute. Josh, can you come up for a second? Alrighty. Good morning. Thanks all for being here today. I'm referring to this as I wish I knew then what I know now, and I wish I knew now what I'm going to know a year from now, because this is a complex process. Uh, if I had known now what I knew, uh, or if I had known a year ago what I know now, we would have got services to our residents much faster. It's a hard, hard thing to learn as you're in the middle of a disaster. And we learn something new every day, and so I anticipate a year from now we'll have a whole bunch more lessons. Let's see if I can do this. I'm not going to read you the statistics. You've heard them. You've seen them. Uh, you've been inundated by them. Needless to say, the campfire was bigger than anything Butte County has ever experienced. Now, we thought we had it all together. We have disasters all the time, unfortunately, but nothing of this magnitude. And what we found out is our state and federal partners most of them had never seen a wildfire of this size. So we had a couple of statements, and this will make Eric laugh. Um, <laughs> throughout the response and recoveries, there were times when we'd just sit there scratching our heads saying there's no playbook for this. There's playbooks now, but a year ago, there weren't playbooks for some of this. And a lot of, hmm, never done this before. So we've been, we're happy to be the beta site and, and learn lessons. And we're hoping that the lessons learned in this size of a disaster, really help regulations, guidelines, trainings at the state and federal level um, going into the future, because I think it was Ryan that said it, FEMA's playbook is not built for wildfires. 
And so there were times we sat around just thinking, this is absurd. What are we doing here? Okay, now, Josh, I'm going to play you about two to three minutes of a video that Channel 10 did. I want to start at the beginning, and we've got to put up with the, the uh, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 on the Hey, are you tired of the media spinning the truth and pushing false narratives? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Go, 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 go. Got gridlock basically everywhere. This is uh, got potential for a major incident. Your request 15 additional engines. One year ago, a spark at the wrong place at an even worse time turned into a firestorm of historic proportions. We have passed by hundreds of homes burning, as well as businesses. Oh my God, the tree's burning right next to us. All those homes I gone. feel the heat now. The campfire burned into the record books as the state's deadliest and most destructive fire ever. The town of Paradise was lost in just hours, along with Concow, Megalia, and the neighborhoods around them. 85 dead, more than 14,000 homes gone an entire community burned to the ground. The fire took everything. <laughs> Paradise is gone. One year later, the ground is still scarred, the pain still fresh, but this community is determined to rise from the ashes. Seeing what they are accomplishing every single day, more lots cleared, you know, it makes you feel like, you know, it, it's happening. It's so people moving on, it's not going to be the same. You know, the town isn't going to be what it was. It kind of died that day. So it's a blank slate now. It can be anything it wants. We can learn from the past and rebuild much better. It's home. It's home. I couldn't imagine going anywhere else and starting over. I will now, whoops, if I could hit a key, launch into lessons learned that we've learned so far, but we know that our story's not over yet. It absolutely takes a village. This slide is not intended to show you all of the partners that came to the table for this disaster and recovery effort, but it does show you that it takes the public, private, education, nonprofits, and faith-based all coming together. No single organization in a disaster this size can do this on their own. And it takes us, Reva and I talked about this, it takes all of us supporting each other because you're right, mutual aid is not the end all in a disaster this size. It's good for fire, it's good for law enforcement, but you're just reaching out and grabbing whoever you can. You have to look behind you because you will be so overwhelmed by what's in front of you if you don't recognize all the good that's been done we have a lot to celebrate. We have over 700 building permits already a year later. Yeah, we have almost 15,000 homes that need to be built, but it's huge. And I have to take this moment now. Alex talked about debris. Ryan talked about debris. The program that Cal OES and Cal Recycle put together was hands down absolutely amazing. Far exceeded anything that we've ever seen did the same thing down in our, in our southern areas. Mother Nature, as we know, was a bear. And so this got done, what do we have, almost 13, no, about 12,000 in the state program that were done in just over six months because we had that crazy weather through May. We had snow in the valley, we, we had floods, we had mudslides. It was pretty insane. And, uh, Ryan talked about two times the amount of debris as was, as was removed from the World Trade Center. As I said before, we've, we're, we've been through disasters. We've had, let's see, in the past 10 years, I can't even count how many local declarations. We've had eight state declarations and we've had five presidential declarations, most of those in the last two years. But nothing, nothing like this. And so we have never been needed to access all of the federal programs that are out there. We've worked with our state partners 
frequently, but we had no idea what the uh, federal um, programs bought to bear. I'm going to speak to this. Uh, Ryan mentioned disasters are at the local level. Um, we started planning for disaster operations or recovery operations when the fire was still burning. We had tens of thousands of people and animals still evacuated. Um, but Santa Rosa gave us a heads up and, and Ryan has told us too, you actually need to be planning for recovery before that disaster. We thought we had, we've, we've had fires, we've done recovery without any federal help. There was no way. So we were trying to create this in the chaos of a disaster. Um, we did request mutual aid to help us with recovery and it was denied. I will tell you, I regret not pushing harder on that. Um, our organization, um, even though we're a county, we're smaller up in, in Northern California, and these same folks that worked emergency operations and recovery have been working it since the middle of 2016, plus doing their day jobs. And I've got to tell you, no organization can be on hyperspeed for this many uh, years and remain healthy. So trying to take care of our organization while we're trying to help our residents, which is why we're there, is uh, really a challenge. Um, I believe, Ryan, with all your planning, that we need to have a serious statewide conversation about local capacity for managing large disasters. Not all counties have the same staff and the financial resources, yet we're all expected to manage them the same. Uh, please know as I discuss lessons learned, you're going to hear frustration. We're still living this. <laughs> Ryan's over there grinning. Um, most of it is with processes and regulations, and primarily from the federal level. Um, it's not with individuals, though. Every one of our partners from the federal and state level has been amazing, and some of them have even been with us since the beginning of the event. From what you see up on the screen, start figuring out what that large recovery structure is going to be when the big one hits your jurisdiction. You can always scale back, but trying to build it in the middle of it is it doesn't work. Let's see, and I'm going to talk really about recovery, not response. And these are the recovery functions that, as the operational area, the county is responsible for if the cities or town can't take these on on their own. And so we, in this fire, had about a third of the damage done in our un unincorporated area. So we had our county hat on and two thirds in one of our towns. And then we, they came to us saying, we can't do this. So we took on and carried that weight for them as the operational area. So there's no playbook. I heard everyone say there's a playbook. There was no playbook. <laughs> there might be a playbook now. But you don't know what to ask for, when to ask for it, how to ask for it. And we've learned to ask questions over and over and over of multiple people because what we found is though individuals are trying to be helpful, and they are helpful, the rules are interpreted differently by organization, federal or state, and then even at the different levels in those organizations. And so just keep asking questions. So sheltering, Ryan said, we just closed down our last shelter after 12 and a half months after the fire. It's crazy. Be prepared for spontaneous shelters. There were just as many spontaneous shelters as there were county um, supported shelters. We had the Hells Angels providing security at a church that was a spontaneous shelter because there were no other resources and someone had a friend of a friend and in they came. So just be prepared for it and thank you to anyone who supported us. We had shelters, as you know, throughout the North State. If you have mass casualties like we did, utilize a family support center. We have never used one of these in the past even though we've, had, we've lost some lives. It's a partnership with Red Cross and it allows families who lost loved ones to go through their recovery process in privacy. They're not there with the thousands of other survivors. The media is not in their face. It's in a totally separate location, and I highly, highly recommend you do it. And to my friends in education, don't forget your office of education. Don't forget your schools. I think, tell me if I'm speaking out of line, Mary. They train in the response, they practice. Recovery is a whole nother thing, right? You, we all got caught a little flat-footed. And so be there to assist them as we understand how to go to the state and how to go to the feds for assistance. A priority in the campfire was getting the schools back up so our kids would have that one piece of normalcy and what there was nothing normal in their lives. 
donations. There really is such a thing as too much of a good thing. We had semi-trucks coming in for months. There was nowhere for all these donations to go. They ended up on street corners. They ended up in vacant parking lots as we, the collective we, every nonprofit and governmental entity in our area was scrambling trying to get warehouse space and put in systems and pull in volunteers from, from all over the nation. Um, at one point, we considered asking the CHP to just not allow any semis into California, but we realized that probably wouldn't. But we're, we were that desperate, like, just don't let them in. Uh, we continue to explore options, um, but I am very interested in what other jurisdictions maybe have done in large disasters to manage the chaos, because the collective we within the county and our partners are really struggling with what is a system, where do we put all this stuff, how do we manage it. Um, for monetary donations, we are very fortunate to have the North Valley Community Foundation. They set up a fund day one. They then partnered with Aaron Rodgers, you might have heard of him, and Sierra Nevada, Nevada Brewery, so hopefully you all bought your resilience. Um, but they've raised $72 million to date. They've given out $27 million so far, and they're in for the long haul. They don't want to give all that money out now. They know it's going to be needed when the state and the feds are gone. That private money is what's going to carry us forward. Uh, we also have the Red Cross and Salvation Army, other organizations collecting monetary donations. And the Red Cross alone has um, awarded over $40 million within Butte County to organizations supporting our survivors. The county and town made a conscious decision not to get in the monetary donation business. We did not want to be the ones deciding who gets what money uh, for what purpose. And so we were glad to have our, our partners just take care of that for us. So highly important, leverage that private money. We work with the foundation constantly saying, no, don't pay for that. Let's get all of the federal and state money, right, Ryan? Get all that money before we start putting that private dollar and don't waste that private dollar. Uh, let's see, um, many of you may have set up local um, assistance centers after some of your disasters. This was so big that FEMA stepped up and actually did the logistics, leased the space for a disaster recovery center, and then we embedded our local assistance center um, services in that disaster recovery center. It was open for three and a half months. It served 55,000 households with over 200,000 visits. So there were days there were thousands of people waiting in line to get services. Um, another thing FEMA did under this event was they deployed mobile disaster recovery centers. They went out to some of the um, larger populated uh, temporary sheltering areas in Northern California and they provided access to FEMA assistance and some state, other state and federal assistance too. Throughout this response, the county and town have been completely dependent on our uh, nonprofit and private sectors to help with the trauma. The physical health, the mental health, we already didn't have enough providers in our county. We lost one hospital. All of those providers that were associated with that facility have been spread out elsewhere. And without them, um, they're still not enough. There is not enough. The trauma from an event this size is huge. As an aside, 400 of our county employees lost their homes out of 2,400, so about 20% of our employees lost their homes, many of the town's employees, one of our board members and all five town council members all lost their homes. So as people are trying to help the residents, they're also dealing with their own trauma. And finally, disaster case management. So this is not even a local jurisdiction function. But I'm bringing it up because it is so critical, and, and Ryan, I think, teed it up for me a little bit because we are working on this right now. It's my understanding, because I'm still figuring this out, federal funding goes through the State Department of Social Services who contracts with local nonprofits. Know that, I didn't even know that, that's how it all flowed till about a month ago. Your residents don't know that, so when it's not working, they're at your board meetings, and your board's saying, what are you doing to fix it? And that's when you figured out, wow, not within my authority, not my sandbox. So the county has stepped up and asked FEMA and uh, state D, uh, Department of 
social services um, to consider partnering with the county in this one. Our nonprofit partners say there are not enough trained disaster case managers in the state to help with this event. They're frustrated. They said, you can keep giving us money. We can't find people. We can't hire people. Um, we have what um, I think Ryan said anywhere from 800 to 8,000 people on waiting lists. The reason no one knows is there's multiple lists and there is no one who has the time and the staff to go through and find out how many are duplicates, how many people have given up waiting and already found their, their own solution. So we don't know how many people are out there and we're trying to partner with the state and with our nonprofits to support them and even provide case management if we need to. So every disaster is different and some of these may not apply uh, to, to your areas, so I'm gonna go through them quickly. We had a watershed task force because our burn area is at the top of some of the more critical watersheds for the state of California. So they serve us locally, but they serve all of our neighbors to the south, including all the water that goes all the way down to Palmdale, out of Lake Oroville right now. So we immediately knew we were gonna have problems. We heard from our, our uh, fellow counties and cities about debris flows. We were hoping for rain. We got too much rain. Um, and so we immediately started working the state and, and federal partners um, gave us authority, found funding, got the California Conservation Corps to come in, placed over 100,000 feet of wattles in critical watershed areas. And if they hadn't, I don't know what the, our watershed would look like because as you know, we had weather, freak weather, for about three months after that. Uh, we also got a heads up from Santa Rosa. I guess we are the second event to have this happen where the fire impacted water systems to the point that there's benzene and VOCs in the systems, not because the water's bad, but because of the chemical compounds in the pipes. If they had not given our water districts a head up, heads up, I don't know that they would have known that was an issue. They probably would have replaced some pipes and started pumping water. Um, so we were glad Santa Rosa gave us a heads up. It was a frustrating journey. Um, we had dueling scientists. We had academia and we had state scientists and we had people who were retired scientists and everyone had an opinion and none of them matched. And so the public lost trust in what's the right testing um, to do, how do I know my water's safe. The state did finally step up, um, I'll get it wrong, I think it's the Division of Drinking Water and Cali PA did step up and issue guidelines for testing, but they didn't want to. They kept saying it's the county's job and we kept saying not our area of expertise. So it's going forward now, but it was a long haul. So this is one where I hope there's a playbook now. There are state standards for how you test if your water systems um, are impacted. And the other, play, uh, other piece that not everyone will have is the timber and biomass um, area. Our area is heavily forested, so we have challenges with hazard trees, with leftover stumps from logging, with slash, and with um, vegetation that grows back with a vengeance after a fire. It's so pretty, right? Oh, look, everything's turning green. And then, oh my God, there's vegetation everywhere. Um, so we, this is a key task we're working on. We have urgency ordinances in place. Um, to relax codes so that log decks can go in areas that they weren't allowed before. We have processing sites that can be used for chipping. Um, and the town is even working with the state, with Cali PA and CARB on um, allowing what's called an air curtain burner, which I didn't know what that was until mm -hmm. a couple of months ago, to um, burn some of that slash and, and vegetative waste um, in an area that's not typically allowed in the state. Um, so your partners at the state, um, I'll tell you, they do everything you need to get her done. Um, we lost a number of public facilities. We lost a historical bridge, fire station, public works yards, offices, vehicles, equipment. We had damage to our landfill, which we needed, right? Because we got debris. Um, so we've been working through all of that. County roads, were damaged from the fire, they're damaged from fire response, they're damaged from debris removal, they'll be damaged from, um, from hazard tree removal. It's really key with your roads, document, document, document at each phase. You can't say here's what it was before the fire, here's what it is at the end. 
because what component, the funding comes in different components. So make sure you're documenting. Uh, we're using a tool, I think it's a FEMA tool, yeah? Um, so that we're, we know we're collecting the right data and have the backup because that, on top of debris, is the place you can get into some arm wrestling for uh, repairs and replacement. Uh, we still have damaged roads that are the single evacuation route for some of our rural communities that are damaged. Makes it really critical, excuse me, to get roads back. And then damaged utilities, we are just starting, I'm gonna have to grab my water. We're just starting to, um, yes, Eric, <laughs> thanks. Uh, we're just starting um, to look at dig once ordinances. And I recommend if you have not looked at undergrounding, excuse me, you may want to consider it at least in your major evacuation routes. So we are considering a dig once policy. You, the town has already adopted one. And we're not saying do it everywhere, but one of the key things that gave you those horrible pictures of people trapped and cars burning was power poles went into the roads. So look into it if you haven't. Let's see here. Ah, temporary housing. <laughs> So we could probably write a book on this. Uh, here's where I really wish I knew then what I know now. Uh, and again, frustration is with regulations, not people. It took us months to understand why temporary housing wasn't moving forward. What's so hard? Find some property, put some mobile home units on it, let's go. Well, we finally figured out the secret. There's four things that have to be in place for temporary housing to work. One is it has to meet FEMA requirements that, yes, I know I'm being recorded, are absurd. They don't work in more rural areas. They want large properties near infrastructure and services. The only large properties we have in Butte County are out in the middle of ag land. They are nowhere near infrastructure and they are nowhere near services. Many of them are in floodplains. Not the whole property, might be 3% of it, but if there's anything that says floodplain, that property is no good. So understand the FEMA requirements. We did not know what they were. It has to meet local land use requirements, and if not, you need to get some urgency ordinances in place if you want to make some sites work. You have to have a willing property owner that has the legal authority to lease the property to FEMA. And yes, there's a story behind that that I'll be happy to share one-on-one. -on -one. And there has to be public support and political will. This is where Ryan got into the NIMBYism. So what we're going to do, because very few of our sites met all four of those requirements, mm -hmm. in any future disaster that requires this temporary housing mission, we're going to require a meeting with FEMA and state st staff to educate them on local land use regulations and authorities. They didn't understand why I couldn't tell the city what to do, but I have no authority within city jurisdictions. We'll request that all decisions get made in meetings with local jurisdictions at the table, not at some field office down here in Sacramento where uh, local input isn't always um, included. We will provide, now that we know FEMA's requirements, we're going to provide a pre-identified list of appropriate sites in all of our jurisdictions that might meet FEMA requirements and that have already been through a public process, right? They've already been approved for a subdivision. They just haven't been built out yet. And then we will also ensure we have the right staff in place working with the mission. We put someone who understood housing out of social services. Now, someone who has land use knowledge and authority to say, here's what we need to do to get that site approved. We have so many urgency ordinances in place now to deal with temporary housing solutions, including FEMA sites. And when it was asked, do we have copies of ordinances? Ours are in chapter 53 of Butte County Code. Feel free to use them. Uh, we have probably put everything in an urgency ordinance by now. Um, there is a playbook for fire debris removal and, and other people have gone into this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Here's some key lessons. Residential is different than commercial and public property, different processes. So don't think you have it all covered with your residential uh, process. Make sure, and sorry, Alex, make sure <laughs> FEMA and Cal OES have reviewed and approved any ordinance you put in place. 
and get it in writing. We had a snafu with a change in federal staff. We had put something in place that we all thought was good, Cal OES, FEMA, and the new FEMA person came in and said, no, nope, that doesn't cut it, it'll make you ineligible. He was probably right. So I'm glad he caught it now and not when I'm getting an OIG audit five years from now. But what it did is we allowed people to go back on their property even if there was fire debris. They just had to stay a certain distance away. We then had to say, never mind, pack up, you have to move off your property. That's what got us in non-congregate shelter for 12 and a half months. Those people just on Saturday were able to finally move back to a, either their next temporary stop or a permanent solution. So just make sure you are in lockstep, your attorneys are in lockstep with the state and the federal attorneys on any ordinance you put in place. Um, the local health declaration, it is required. Not all health officers believe it should be. So I recommend you talk to your health officer, that's at the county level, and know where their head is on this because you don't want to start battling over this when the disaster has happened and you have debris you need to clean up. So you need to know what their position is. I will tell you the, the health officers in the state of California are trying to get the federal law changed that ties debris to a local health declaration because they don't believe it's the right tool. You may also need urgency ordinances for temporary sites for concrete, for metal, for contractor base camps, for lay down yards, all kinds of things I never had to know about, and now I do. Uh, the right of entry program, Ryan mentioned, it's on you as locals. It is a heavy lift. It took 60, six zero employees at the <coughs> peak of our right of entry program, and it's still in operation today, a year later. And we don't have 60 employees in the county that have the knowledge needed because you're running the state's right of entry program and you're running your county alternative program, which means some scientific types have to be reviewing reports and saying, yes, does that soil sample say it's clear now? We use county staff, we use retired annuitants, we use um, contract staff from the California Environmental Health Association, mutual aid staff, and then our Alliance for Workforce Development, which is our local workforce group. That right of entry program cost us about $2 million. That was just to staff it and take in paper and process it. Um, if you run a local landfill, know your capacity. We had to run a separate operations for debris so it didn't impact our franchise haulers and our, our local customers. And know that private landfills will not be happy that public landfills are taking debris because they want the business. So there's a lot of politics that come into. The tr be part of establishing traffic plan. The state and federal government do not know what your traffic patterns are. They didn't know that our traffic goes way down in the summer because all the teachers aren't commuting from Chico to Oroville and all the Chico State students are gone. So we help them understand ramp up in the summer, hit it hard, and get out of the way once school comes back. Uh, let's see, and use lessons learned by other jurisdictions. We learned from Sonoma and Shasta. We learned with the state because they learned what not to do in Sonoma. So <laughs> we all learn together. Uh, there is no playbook for hazard tree <coughs> removal unless I'm missing something. No? Do we have a playbook, Alex? No, no, no playbook. Um, it is an allowable cost. You You're heard, right huh? We're writing, writing one. Right now. We are, we're writing one. Um, it is an allowable cost, so don't take no for an answer. Do it with your fire debris. Even if it takes that time, we're gonna spend another $2 million doing right of entry for trees now, and you talk about frustrating, traumatized people already. What do you mean? I already gave you that information. It's gotta be a whole new sign form, has to have the backup documentation. Uh, we are currently approved for hazard trees in the public right of way and on private property that could impact the public right of way. And what we are doing on all of your behalf that have trees in your jurisdictions is we are really advocating for FEMA to cover trees on private property that will fall on orphan roads. And an orphan road is a road that's not publicly maintained, but it's used by your residents as part of their traffic circulation in their community because they are just as much at risk from one of those falling hazard trees on those orphan roads as they are on a public road. So we're still waiting, right? We'll see what happens, but we will continue pushing for that and hopefully have a playbook with how do you justify those orphan roads. 
Uh, again, you'll need urgency ordinances. It's a mandatory program. And as I said, another $2 million for that ROE. All righty. This slide makes my stomach drop every time I see it. So this is from Robert Eiler, who's a professor at Sonoma State University and president of Economic Forensics and Analytics. I have to give him a plug because I stole this slide. Um, this shows the housing challenge Butte County faces in contrast to those seen in other counties in Northern California that have experienced catastrophic wildfires. Now, we lost 17% of our housing stock in the campfire, and we had a 1% to 2% <coughs> vacancy rate to begin with. Look at that line. It's going to take a decade at least to bring it back up to where it was, which wasn't even sufficient for the population at that time. Um, it's not all doom and gloom, though. Uh, we have private contractors have stepped up. They are building houses that they had not planned on building for years down in the valley for those folks who either don't have the ability to go back to the burn area or they're too traumatized, they don't want to live back there. So housing stock, as much as the private sector can do, is coming back. Uh, there's funding in the state budget and state legislation, as you know, to fund uh, infrastructure to support infill, so within the city of Chico especially, and hopefully in Oroville. There's some money that will widen those roads, so subdivisions that have been sitting there waiting to be developed can be developed. And some jurisdictions did receive authority to waive CEQA under certain conditions for residential development. It's not a blanket waiver. Uh, state requirements for solar on new houses have been waived in the burn area. And private nonprofit and faith-based organizations are really, really working on solutions for those underinsured and uninsured that have no, they have nothing right now. Uh, we did adopt appendices to the building code. So we now allow for tiny homes or little houses, as those people from the South call them, light straw clay construction, straw bale construction, and emergency housing. And once CDBGDR comes out, which probably is not till 2021, that will be what we will be looking at for a lot of our low-income housing. We're, getting, we're almost done here. Uh, the Economic and Business Recovery Task Force is a partnership with a bunch of our, our education, nonprofit, economic development partners. They're focused on regional economic impacts because just the town of Paradise burning down has widespread implications for businesses elsewhere. Uh, they are looking at um, additional workforce for high demand occupations and they have developed an action plan that's been shared with the governor and with our legislators. Three really key recovery support um, functions, and I think Alex and Ryan touched on this too, cost recovery for large disasters is complicated. Get a consultant, add staff, the paperwork will bury you. And Ryan, I'll believe it when I see it that it's all going to be computerized. <laughs> we'll love it. Key lessons learned, don't accept the first answer you get. You will get different answers. Keep asking until your gut says, okay, I think, I think this is it. Don't take no for an answer. Get it in writing, even though that doesn't guarantee the answer won't change, and follow federal procurement procedures. Um, we know that from all of the um, disasters we've been through, but we found a lot of our partners saying, well, I just want to hire this person. Oh, no, you need all these things attached to the contract. You've got to go through the right procurement. And we wouldn't be where we are today without our federal and state legislators. We all got together, school districts, um, cities, special districts, the county, and we developed one legislative platform about two weeks into the fire because we all, need, we all needed property tax, right? So let's not hit up our legislators with multiple requests. So we built a single platform and you need your strong relationships with your legislators and with their staff. Their staff are key, they have been so amazing probably heard we asked for backfill of property taxes for multiple years and we got it. Um, the town and county contract with Cal Fire for fire services, so we asked for some fire contract support and we asked for regulatory and funding support for permanent housing solutions. Under the federal um, request, it was reduce or waive the local share of costs. Someone showed, I think Alex, that it's six and a quarter percent. As we look at tens and tens of millions of dollars, six and a quarter percent is a big number. We have received um, 
a reduction that's down to about two and a half percent for categories A and B, emergency response and, and debris. And we are continuing to ask for that for roads because the amount of damage to our roads and the local cost share will be cost prohibitive. We've also asked for additional supplemental funding for a number of the federal agencies that will be supporting recovery or efforts because we don't think their um, current appropriations are gonna be enough. And I have to thank all those people up on the screen who you probably know all their faces. Um, every one of them has worked miracles for us. They have worked together. They are not all from the same political party. They have worked together and they are heroes. Even if they weren't putting the fire out, we wouldn't be where we were without them. And finally, information, Joint Information Center, whether it's virtual or physical is key. We work together, state, county, town, uh, feds on common messaging. If it crosses jurisdictions, we do our own thing. If it's just about our jurisdiction, but we keep each other in the loop, so there's no surprises. Um, we did create ButteCountyRecovers.org website and Paradise created MakeItParadise.org. The recovery website is all things recovery. The Make It Paradise is really about their vision for the long haul. So the county's doing all the recovery efforts on their behalf so they can basically reinvent themselves. And we message in multiple ways. Reva said this, we lose communications in every disaster. We have people who already aren't connected to technology. Uh, we have what we call the black holes of communication in our foothills. There is no cell service. People's phones are voice over IP. Power goes down, Comcast line burns. There's no communication. So our communities are now looking at ham radio. They're all setting up their own ham radio systems. And so it takes one call to one person from the EOC or the sheriff or fire, and then that word spreads. On that note, oh, wait, one more. Expect the unexpected. It's really hard to bring mutual aid in when you have no place for them to stay. I always laughed. I would open my door at you know midnight, and there'd be this knock, and I'd say, Jack? Yeah, Sherry? You'd open the door. <laughs> you go, hi, nice to meet you. Here's your room. Here's your bathroom. OK, see you in the morning. Perfect strangers coming in our houses but we had no place else to put them. So we're gonna create a, a registry of county employees that have the capacity and willingness to house mutual aid if needed, or you need to be ready to do base camps. State and feds know that they had to build huge base camps. There were no hotel rooms, there were no mobile homes, there was nothing available. There's also turnover at the federal and state levels, and I understand why. These are folks who've been away from home for a while, but it's hard. It's hard, it's, it's not a smooth transition. It takes time to bring them up to speed, time you don't have. It's emotionally draining because you, then you gotta relive everything to, to let them know what the local picture is. Um, this'll make, I think this'll probably make Eric laugh. Tom's not around. Tom Graham, you listening? <laughs> they have been so patient with us. They've used a lot of A words to call us names. And we've been called assertive, and we've been called aggressive. <laughs> He's over <laughs> laughing. We've been called advocates. The thing is, that's our job. If we're not advocating for our residents, who is? And I, I appreciate and I respect that our partners have to push back as much as we're pushing on them because none of us want audit findings. None of us want to have to pay back a bunch of money. And so there's this respect that these are our roles, this is what we have to do, but we respect if we can't get everything we need and they respect that we gotta push and ask. So be an advocate. And then um, urgency ordinances, you get the picture. There are so many urgency ordinances. We have adopted an urgency ordinance at almost every meeting for the last 12 months. So be prepared and feel free to use any. Now Ryan asked me to talk about recovery support functions. Thanks for putting me on the spot. Probably the thing I know the least about. Um, I can tell you, um, they came in in December when we were in the middle of response. And so I think we've learned a lesson. Don't send these folks in when people are in response because we didn't know who they were, why were they there, who are these people, why are they bothering us, we don't have time for this. And they sat there wanting to help, wanting to help, and we couldn't even engage, or they'd try to engage us, and we had fire brain, and a month later would go, who are you, what are you doing here, why are you here? It is an amazing 
um, amount of resources that the federal and state governments will bring to help you. Um, try to learn what it is they'll do for you. And, and you say, I have this need, and then they say, here's some funding options you can look at. They don't have money, but they can, they can try to connect you to money. The town has really benefited. I think Pune showed that list. The town, is, as the county was taking care of all the recovery immediate needs, the town has been able to do a full on visioning process, identified the projects, state and, and federal RSFs help them find the funding sources for it. So it is a beautiful model that the town has really utilized and I think it's shown success and it's one that the county still hasn't been able to step up and take advantage of, but I'm hoping soon that we'll get there. I know we're finally, we're starting to meet and identify projects. So, and my understanding is it's never, all six functions have never been stood up before in the state of California, so it's been a learning experience for all of us. So on that note, it's been a hell of a year. <laughs> right, Reva? <laughs> Eric, Ryan, Alex, yep, yep, it's been a year. Uh, thanks for attending and listening to the litany of lessons. Um, I hope it was helpful. We have so much information. This was a year, you know, put down into about 35 minutes. Call us. Um, my email is on the PowerPoint. Eric sent the PowerPoint out. Reach out. We are happy to share anything that we've learned, anything that we, we will learn in the future. So have a good one, guys. Thank you, Sherry, for that. If I could ask... Actually, Sherry, if I could ask you and Reva to maybe both join us at the table in the front. We're going to put you both under the microscope for a little bit and try to take any questions from here in the room as well as online that folks may have for you. So I'll get it started. What is, knowing what you know now, what is the first thing you're going to do? happens next time to both of you. Hit the button there. Uh, Google already have a recovery plan in place and we are going to identify more staff. We don't have sufficient staff. Our organization is dying and so we have to go figure out what are those resources. Of course we gotta get done with this one before we can plan is the problem. Mics aren't working so much. Oh. I don't think there's one thing that you can do. I think it's stepping back for a moment and gathering yourself. I actually have a checklist that I keep with me um, of what to do in the first hour um, so that I don't forget any of these very important things that you can forget when um, chaos starts because that's what happens and then you don't get out of chaos. Um, so I think it's um, being prepared and um, thinking now in uh, blue skies what you can collectively put together so that when it's not blue skies, you're not thinking on the fly. Um, take advantage of what I've been through or Butte County has been through. I had the advantage of having worked in the Tubbs Fire and the EOC and um, learning what Santa Rosa went through and they were a year ahead of me and I just would call the city manager and say, what about this? What did you do for this? And not trying to reinvent everything. So I hope that answers your question. And I did just want to say that I was the only speaker that didn't um, thank OES for the debris removal program. Um, it, it really was an amazing success. And last week, um, our final property uh, got into compliance for the opt-out program. So we'll have 100% compliance without doing any of the And just to clarify, my plan's on recovery. Um, because that was the piece that we were not completely prepared for. Let's go ahead and hold on to that microphone. Do we have a question in the room? I always I, have a question for the audience. Before. So Bennett, just because I know you, I've been, I think I spent more time with you than anybody in this room over the last month, just in meetings. Uh, just gonna, so just listening to what you heard today, like what is your, I wouldn't say so much question, but what's your takeaway? Uh, and, uh, I'll actually bring it to mind. I think one of the, the questions I initially had was, how do you measure success without how long the event is? What were the metrics? What were the things you kind of used to check back in? Are we moving forward? Because I think for an event this size, this complex, you get that tunnel vision, which is okay, the debris and the housing, but how do you kind of keep on measuring and saying we are improving? 
that would be for the next one. So, right, this has been so big with limited uh, resources that you're right, we're, we're basically, we need to get debris done and then what's the next thing? Looking 10 metrics out, we're not there. That's what I would hope, that we then, when we finally have time to debrief, and I'll tell you, we haven't even done our after action report yet. It's been a year. We did one meeting and I think we have another one in January, but staff is 24 seven on recovery right now. So plan ahead. Um, I think I think it almost doesn't matter what you've achieved because for those people who have been displaced and aren't in a home and a year out, nobody is back in an, their home. They didn't rebuild. They've moved on. They're in another town. Um, their children are in different schools. And so for me personally, it's very hard for me to say we've achieved anything. Yes, we've done a lot. Yes, we're in compliance with debris removal. Yes, we got through the winter storms. Yes, we've passed a lot of ordinances. We've had hundreds of meetings and town hall meetings, but um, until everybody has a home again, that, that's the success for me. To both of you, um, we've set up a construct of emergency management in California. Our activities are generally focused on coordinating directly with the counties that we refer to as operational areas. They, in turn, work to support and gather information from the jurisdictions within their area. I think, uh, certainly, on, I think in both of your cases, that probably didn't happen exactly the way that construct is set up. And, and maybe for better or worse, that is, that's fine, but I'd, I'd like to maybe get some perspective from both the county and the city side in terms of how it's supposed to work, how it does work, maybe what we need to be thinking about as city and county folks listening. I think when you're in the midst of the, the disaster, you're just thinking of the, it's, it's a triage, right? So you've got a problem ahead of you and how are you gonna solve that one problem at that moment and then you move on to the next problem. For me, um, I'm very relationship based. I'm very fortunate to have very strong relationships um, with uh, everybody in the county, on the state, um, and I'm fairly fearless that I don't have a problem saying someone get me the governor's phone number, I need to get something from him, and then I pick up the phone and I call. Um, but not everybody operates that way, and so I think it's having um, folks from your department or, or wherever it needs to be showing up and saying, what can we do to help? What is the gap? What do you need? Because we're just worrying about problem A that's right in front of us in that given moment. I would say it's not a clear-cut answer. So in the case of the campfire with the town that was destroyed and was living out of buildings in Chico, we as the operational area in the county trying to do everything we were doing in response and then in recovery, it took both. It took that standard communication for certain things, I think more in emergency response and in recovery, I think it's been really important that the state has direct communications with the town. Um, so I, it's, not a, it's not a one size. Um, and I think the key thing we've all learned is let's keep each other in the loop <coughs> just so we don't have any missteps or, or get two different answers. Um, but otherwise, I think we all have to just follow our gut in the event. I don't think you can just draw this little diagram and that's the way it needs to be. Thank you for that. Pune? So you talked a lot about, um, you talked a lot about the, the tremendous weight on you as you were trying to respond to this event and the early stages of recovery. One of the things that was really hard for us as the state and federal partners was not to step in too quickly and um, offend you by leaning in when you weren't ready and or stay back when you were ready to engage and then we weren't at the table. So in terms of all the other counties, what would you advise us um, in terms of um, how to best engage with you so that we can come to the table at the right time, not too early and not too late with all the other counties if they ever had an event? That's a great question. So I have to tell you, one of the problems with the campfires, we all have fire brain. And so my memory and my recollection and chronology are just all messed up. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, what happened is just suddenly one day I got reached out to by someone named Joan who said, hey, we're in town and we're here to do it. And I'm like, who are you? Well, you know, wait, I gotta go. 
Um, so I think it's a more, maybe it's a slower pace. It's, it's um, being really clear on what you bring to the table so that we can say, okay, here's when we need that to come in. And I think it was our lack of understanding of what, what this resource was and the fact that it was being stood up for the first time in the state um, and our lack of ability to even retain anything in our brains at the time. So I, I think it might take a few conversations before a whole flock of folks come, come to town um, for us to be prepared because we're the ones that weren't able to be a partner in that, the town much more so than the county was. I just want to echo what she says. So in the immediate disaster and the aftermath of it, you're talking to hundreds and thousands of people every day. You're also not sleeping. You're also probably displaced. And so you you can't remember. I mean, I have so many business cards and people that give me, and I, I don't even remember having the conversation. And so it's reaching out and then reaching out again or asking for you know someone on my staff that you can follow up with because if you try to follow up with me on that given day i might have had 75 phone calls and i'm, I'm never going to get to you so i think it's being persistent and remember that the people you're trying to get a hold with a hold of, are just overwhelmed with tasks and responsibilities and everything else. i think one other bit of advice for folks in the room and watching online is when you're sitting in either reva or sherry's seat and you have somebody, and I say this with much respect because we have some phenomenal partners with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, especially out here in California. But when somebody from FEMA shows up on day one or day two of your event and wants to sit down and meet with you, one of the things I would ask you to respectfully ask of them is I am happy to meet with you. Let's get Cal OES in here as well. Because what happens sometimes is we start going down a path, perhaps a good path, but it's one that we need to collaborate and coordinate with our federal partners so that we can ensure that at the end of the day, we're meeting your needs with all available state and federal programs. So we have some, uh, FEMA's got some tremendous resources, a lot of personnel that move into the field quickly. We work to be with them, can't always happen. So we uh, just ask you if, if that person wants to have that meeting with you, happy to meet with you. Let's get Cal OES in the room too so that we can collaborate together. Would you, would you agree, Sure. And document, document, yes. and then document some more and then make copies of that and give them to somebody else. <laughs> All right, any final questions in the room? Uh, Chris, is there anything online? Okay. Yeah, Brian, uh, you can have the last word. No, you can have the last word because I'm about to thank you. So uh, first off, thank you to uh, uh, of Sherry and Raven, I promise I'm gonna get to, to you with my team, Leia. She's my t task force. But I don't know if y'all realize that, you know, we have a little, another PSPS event happening and it may impact over 250,000 people and it looks like it just start Wednesday. So as we were sitting here, uh, Eric is managing that entire incident for the state. Uh, so I just wanna thank you, uh, Eric, for that. That's all, thanks. So I have, I have one last tip that I like to leave everybody with is that when you don't have power and you need information, you can get in your car and listen to the radio. If you do not own a crank radio, you can always get in your car. Thank you for that. Sherry, any final words from you? No? All right. Then that concludes. And as we said at the beginning, your feedback in this process uh, your feedback is important, so let us know what else you want to hear about. We are hoping to hold three more of these seminars uh, from January through June uh, with the anticipation of having another emergency management summit uh, in uh, the summertime uh, of next year. So let us know what is that content on the emergency management response recovery arena that you need to learn more about, talk more about, let us know. And we'll use that uh, again with our partners from CSAC, the League, the Institute of Local Governments to make sure that these are as useful as they can be for you. So thank you everybody in the room and online for joining us today. Eric, except I just remembered something. And Sherry Sorry. has one final thought. Sorry. Um, I have thrown out a proposal that I don't know if it will get legs, but I'm throwing it out to you as my peers. If you're familiar with CAL FIRE and the, the um, auto aid, mutual aid um, program, 
they have incident command teams, right, that have people from different jurisdictions that then go to an event when it gets too large for the local jurisdiction to handle. So having had as many disasters as we've had and having the same people work in the EOC and recovery, I would love to see statewide EOC incident command teams. I would love us to partner with cities, special districts, schools, counties to build those teams, to work together, to practice where we can go into anyone's EOC. I would say the EOC director always should be the local person, but let us come in and be the plans chiefs and all of that. Um, I know none of us have any spare time, but I think from what we've experienced, that would be a huge, huge thing for us to do. So thank you for that's a great recommendation and something that is on our to-do list here at Cal OES um, to work in partnership with the locals. So thank you for that recommendation. Ryan, you've got the last word. Thank you. Uh, so regarding what you just mentioned, uh, you know, my former, right when I left uh, uh, FEMA, I was a director of the National Qualification System. So that whole job was to get out in front of this locals and uh, uh, states to to, quantify, to well qualify that. So to what you just mentioned, um, they do, we did, we, they released uh, the EOC side of the house uh, earlier this year. There's over 100 positions, and I haven't had the chance to sit down with the director and the executive team to, to pitch this to uh, the state. I do plan on doing that tomorrow with the director in the plane. I'll have some time with him. Uh, so I'm gonna ask him, I think it's a good idea, not only to serve that need, Jerry, but just, just, uh, I mean, I don't know at the state level, how many operation chiefs do I have? I should know the answer to that. I should know the answer of how many IA branch chiefs I have within my own recovery unit. How many people are qualified have done that? Uh, a lot of what we do in individual assistance, other components of Cal OES serves those needs. Uh, so it's one thing I want to bring to Cal OES. Um, it's free, uh, but it would actually address exactly what you just mentioned. So I'll keep everyone here informed of what that looks like. Thanks.